Our story opens today in the post office at Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, a tiny Northwoods hamlet with a total population of 48. Of course, that's during the summer rush. This is the postmaster, James J. Nearly, sorting the mail. Here is the pigeonhole belonging to the town's most illustrious citizen, Rocket J. Squirrel. Next to it, the pigeonhole belonging to his pal, Bullwinkle Moose. And next to that, the pigeonhole belonging to... Uh, well, who are you? What else? I'm a pigeon. But it is the spot belonging to Bullwinkle that we're interested in. For going into it right now is a letter which will change the whole course of Rocky and Bullwinkle's life. And if that's not a good beginning to a story, I don't know what is. Just then, the door swung open. Hi, Mr. Nearly. Any mail today? Well, I put your fan mail in those two sacks there, Rocky. Fine. Nothing for me, I suppose. Matter of fact, you do have one letter, Bullwinkle. I do? Now, who do I know that can write? Open it, Bullwinkle. It may be important. Oh, I wish you hadn't said that, Rock. Now I'm too nervous to open it. Okay, I will. Hmm, it's from a New York law firm. That's pretty bad right there. My dear Mr. Moose. That's me, all right. This is to inform you that your Uncle Dewlap passed on last month. Uncle Dewlap? Gee, I'm sorry, Bullwinkle. Were you very close? I never heard of him. It says here he was your uncle twice removed. Twice removed? Once for vagrancy and once for loitering. I still never heard of him. He's left you an inheritance that... Oh, that Uncle Dewlap. You remember him now? Remember my favorite in-law? Oh, shame, Rock. What'd he leave me? Let's see. It's a mine. It's a yours. He was my uncle. No, no, he left you a mine. A claim to a mine. Ha, diggity, where is it? Says here it's on the slopes of Mount Flatten. Mount Flatten. Uh. What's wrong with him? Hey, Mr. Nearly. Gee, he's really canceled. Mount Flatten must be a scary place. Who cares? I'm the proud owner of a genuine gold mine. Let's go find it. Bullwinkle dashed gleefully from the post office, followed by Rocky. Neither of the boys was aware of a skulking figure that silently slunk after them. Wait! Wait up, Bullwinkle! It doesn't say gold mine! Gold mine, diamond mine, who cares? But at that moment, a short way behind them, the sinister figure drew back its arm and a big knife flashed in the sunlight. Hey, be careful there! That's no way to treat a good knife! Bullwinkle, there's a message on it! Two letters in one day, how about that? This one doesn't sound so good. To Moose, it may concern. Keep away from Mount Flatten or you will die slowly, horribly. Signed, a friend. Well, that does it, Bullwinkle. It does? Yep. This letter means that that mine must be worth an awful lot. And somebody's really going to try to keep us away from it. Yeah. Oh, well, we can always go back to the internet branches. No, sir, Bullwinkle. We're going to go to Mount Flatten and claim that claim. I'm with you, Rock. Hand me my suitcase. Little did Bullwinkle know that inside his suitcase was a charge of TNT wired to go off as soon as he opened it. Well, will our hero's adventure stop before it even starts? And who or what is that mysterious knife-throwing stranger? Don't miss our next episode, Big Bomb at Frostbite Falls or The Exploding Metropolis. Last time, you remember, Bullwinkle inherited a mine from his Uncle Dulap. Nobody seemed to know what kind of mine it was, but somebody sure wanted to keep our boys away from it. But whoever it was didn't reckon on the determination of our heroes, for with more courage than brains, they started to pack. Nobody's going to scare us, eh, Bullwinkle? No, not you anyways, Rock. Besides, what can happen to us here in our own little home, sweet home? But unbeknownst to Bullwinkle, a can of TNT had been placed inside his suitcase, wired to go off as soon as he opened it. And a little way from the house, a mysterious figure seemed to be waiting for the explosion. Come on, Bullwinkle, I'm almost packed. In a second, Rock, I can't get this catch undone. Here, try the screwdriver. Come on now, doggone it. But the boys fussed and fumed over the suitcase to no avail. Maybe if I just sort of kicked it a little. And with his mighty hoof, Bullwinkle booted the suitcase clear out of the window. Down the hill it went. And as it landed beside the skulking figure, the lid flew open. No, no! What was that, Rock? I'm not sure, but I think you need a new suitcase. Gee, I don't know my own strength. No, Bullwinkle. It must have been full of dynamite or something. Well, I always did get a big bang out of traveling. Dynamite? Yeah. Well, I know travel's supposed to be broadening, but this is ridiculous. A short while later, the intrepid adventurers were on their way. Little did they know that sharp eyes were watching them from a high vantage point. A few days later, they were speeding through some pretty desolate country. 
how do we know when we're getting there, Rock? Just follow the signpost, Bullwinkle, see? Mount Flatten, ten miles. We're on the right road, Rock. Yeah, but we must be going too fast. Look, there's a motorcycle following us. Uh Uh-oh. Pull over, Bullwinkle. The boys pulled to the side of the road and Rocky got out to speak to the approaching officer, but the motorcycle did not slow down. Hey! No policeman, that's... Look out, Rocky! And the motorcycle roared right at our friends and then flashed past. What a crazy driver! Yeah, look at him, turning that corner on two wheels. Gee, that was close. Close? Look at my hoofs. What are those marks, Bullwinkle? Tire tracks, that's what. Well, it's all over, Bullwinkle. He must be miles away by now. But unbelievable though it may seem, Rocky was wrong. For just around the next curve, the motorcyclist had stopped and was changing the road sign removing one that pointed to a secret military reservation and putting up one that said, This way to Mount Flatten. Then he hit quickly as our heroes approached. Bullwinkle, we turn here. Right, Rock. And our heroes blithely rode straight into frightful danger. Oh, what foul fiend could do a trick like that? What venal villain? What perfidious scoundrel? Allow me to introduce myself. Boris Badenov at your service. Yes, it was true. The mysterious stranger was Boris Badenov, the world's lowest snake in the grass. Please, no more compliments. You'll turn my pretty hair. Meanwhile, our heroes, all unknowing, bounced along the road of a top-secret military reservation. Hey, we're almost there, Rock. How do you know? Look at that sign. Watch out for mines. Yeah, there must be a lot of them besides ours. I don't think it means that kind of mine. Well, this time Rocky was right, for at that moment the boys were driving over a field of highly explosive landmines, which were buried a few inches under the ground and ready to go off from the slightest pressure. You'll be here next time, won't you? For The Road to Ruin or Mine Over Matter. Well, our heroes have been tricked into making a detour on their way to Mount Flatten to find Bullwinkle's mine. Their nemesis is, who else, that fiend in human form, Boris Badenov. Ah, but remember, a fiend in need is a fiend indeed. Now Rocky and Bullwinkle are bouncing along through a top-secret military reservation. Sure, a lot of billboards on this road. I can't see the view. Suddenly, Rocky came to a dreadful conclusion. Bullwinkle, we're in the middle of a minefield. Hot biggie! We'd better stop. Yeah, let's start digging. No, Bullwinkle. I mean landmines. You were expecting water mines? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Water... Boy, they got pretty noisy dirt in these parts. I've been trying to tell you. A landmine is kind of an underground bomb. Oh. And we're surrounded by them. Then I guess I both need the old shovel. Oh, boy. Two explosions. That should do the dirty trick. Well, cheerio. I'm off to Mount Flatten. We're off, darling. What you are doing here, sweetheart? Keeping you from stealing Moose's mine all for yourself, darling. Who, me? Honey, pumpkin. Would I double-cross and go on partner? You tell me. <laughs> yes, I would. Okay. And the two villains zoomed off to jump Bullwinkle's claim to his Uncle Dewlap's mine. But are you sure Moose and Squirrel won't bother us? <laughs> I send them into minefield, Natasha. Listen. Beautiful music. Dangerous landmines. Which way now, Rock? Gee, I don't know, Bullwinkle. Then let's toss a coin. Okay. Heads we go north, tails we go south. Looks more like we go west. But Rocky and Bullwinkle weren't the only ones worried about their plight. For all over the area, people were listening to the explosion. What do you figure it is, Slim? Thunder, I reckon. Thunder? But it ain't rained here in 40 years. Yep, I figure rain's just about due. In a nearby Indian village, the people flocked to their medicine man to find the reason for the noises from the sky. Oh, our who never sleep is great money too hungry. Ugh, maybe, but more likely as a shock wave produced by an aircraft at a velocity greater than that of sound. I dig him. He says it's probably sonic boom. Ugh. <gasps> and at a secret launching pad headquarters in the middle of the desert, there was general consternation and his staff of missile experts. Gentlemen, this is the most top secret hush hush base in the whole country, right? Yes, yes General. General. Well, listen. Does that sound hush-hush to you? No, No, General. General. Radar shows there are two nitwits wandering around in the minefields. They must be silenced. Yes, Yes, General. General. 
And I don't care how. Yes, Yes, General. General. And so in just a few minutes, two huge steel monsters rumble toward our friends, their guns ready to blast them sky high. Uh Uh-oh. What are they, Rock? Tanks, Bullwinkle. Hmm? I said tanks, Bullwinkle. Oh, do I have to say it? You better. Our time is running out. Okay. You're well... Too late. Be sure to see our next episode, Two Flying Ghosts or High Spirits. Well, happy days are here again for Boris and Natasha. Boris sent Rocky and Bullwinkle into a secret missile base where they immediately ran into a minefield. Then there was General Consternation and his staff, who sent a couple of tanks out to investigate intruders. The two tanks ground to a stop at the edge of the minefield, then suddenly a loudspeaker blared. This is Major Hardrock of the Intruder Disposal Corps. You are to leave this area immediately. But we can't. We're surrounded by landmines. Yeah, and they go off real easy, too. Why, if we was to just step over there... See what I mean? Very well. This means we must use the intruder disposal unit, M3. What do you suppose that M3 unit is, Bullwinkle? I don't know, but I don't like the sound of that word disposal. Then the turrets of the tank slowly opened. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle, look at that. I didn't think I'd like it. Yes, an enormous mechanical hand emerged from the tank and firmly clutched our heroes in its iron grip. Now what do you suppose happens? The boys soon found out, for at that moment a huge mechanical foot also made its appearance. No, I know what they mean by disposal. Fire two! And our heroes went sailing through the air. Meanwhile, out on the highway, Boris and Natasha sped along on their motorcycle. Won't be long, Natasha. We'll be at Mount Flatten. You sure Moose and Squirrel won't show up unexpectedly? I'm absolutely puzzled. By now, they've been blown into itsy little bits. They're goners, kaput, all finished. Then who was that we just passed? Ghosts! Must have been ghosts! Hitchhiking? And Boris quickly pulled the motorcycle to a halt. What are you going to do now, Boris? You couldn't guess, Natasha? Me? World's number one villain? Cold blooded nerves of steel? What would I do? What? I cry like baby! <laughs> Boris! And while Boris tried to drain the tears out of his goggles, Rocky and Bullwinkle were still trying to hitch a ride to Mount Flatten. Hey, how about it? Can you give us a... Gee, we could be stranded here from now on, Bullwinkle. Well, I'll stop the next car, Rock. How? I'll just lie down here in the road is what. Hey, that's dangerous. Tut, tut, Rocket. Who in the world would ever run over somebody laying in the middle of the road? Well, now we know who. But it seemed the driver of that large limousine had seen Bullwinkle, for the car stopped and began to back up. Looks like he's coming back for another crack at you, Bullwinkle. Now that is going a little too far. Hey, he's stopping. <laughs> I told you it'd work. Gee, this is awful nice of you, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. He's probably shy, Rocky. Let's just get in. Our heroes did get into the limousine and it started off down the road. It's a little warm in here, Bullwinkle. Let's roll down a window. Okay, Rock. Hey, that's funny. What? There's no window cranks. No door handles either. Hey, I don't like this, Bullwinkle. I'm not exactly crazy about it myself. Hey, mister, what kind of car is this anyway? But still the driver remained silent. For had our boys only known it wasn't a real driver at all, but only a dummy fastened to the wheel. And yet with no human hand to control it, the limousine roared on faster and faster toward... What? We'll find out next time in Crash Drive or Oedipus Rex. Last time, you remember, Rocky and Bullwinkle, who were stranded in the desert, got a ride in a long limousine. It was only when they were inside the car that they found it had... No window cranks! No door handles! Must be one of those economy models! No, sir, Bullwinkle! Something's wrong here! Hey, mister! But as Rocky shook the driver's shoulder, his hat fell off. Bullwinkle, he's a dummy! Please, Rock, you were speaking of our host. But look, he really is a dummy! So he is! You know what that means, Bullwinkle? Yeah, he must have cheated on his driver's test. No, it means we're going 80 miles an hour with nobody at the wheel! Here, let me get it, Rock! And Bullwinkle grabbed the steering wheel, only to have it come off in his hand. I was right, it is the economy model. Meanwhile, a short distance ahead... Boris and Natasha were still wondering how to keep our friends from getting to Mount Flatten ahead of them. 
Hey, Moose and Squirrel just got picked up by limousine. They'll be here in a minute, darling. We must think fast. Think hard, Natasha. And Natasha did think hard and came up with a brilliant idea. I will change the road signs. So without telling Boris, Natasha changed the road signs to direct traffic over a nearby cliff. Oh, Boris will be so proud of me. Then, unfortunately, Boris had the same idea. Hey, I got it. I changed road signs. And he unwittingly changed the signs back to the way they should be. <laughs> Natasha will be so proud of me. It's all settled, Natasha. Let's go. Turn right here, Boris. Don't be silly, Natasha. I changed the signs. But Boris saw the... And the motorcycle went off the road and plummeted downward. After this, Natasha, remember who is brains of this outfit. I figure way out of things. Hey, brains. Yeah? Figure a way out of this. Oh, boy. And the motorcycle plunged into the treetops below and came to rest hanging from a branch. Well, here we are, safe with sound. Meanwhile, as they say, Moose and Squirrel are beating us to Mount Flatten, Mr. Brains. Natasha wouldn't have felt so bitter if she knew our friend's plight. The limousine did take the right turn at the detour, but then started down the mountain road at breakneck speed. Get the wheel back in, Bullwinkle. I'm trying, Rook. I'll see if I can turn off the engine. Unfortunately, there were far too many buttons and knobs on the dashboard, and Rocky accidentally turned on the radio instead. All right, you guys, sit still. Yes, sir. Put your hands up. Anything you say. This is the end for you, rats. I had a hunch it was. Oh, they got me, Rock. Stay tuned now for the second half of Mike Mallet, Public Private Eye. But first, a brief word from our sponsor. Bullwinkle, it was just the radio. I'm not dead and killed and all. No, but it looks like it's just a matter of time. Fortunately for our friends, the road just then opened out to a flat straightaway. Boy, that was pretty hair-raising. You were telling me. I wonder how we made it down safely. I'm not sure we did. Well, we could look at the wheel. Something or somebody steering this car by remote control. The brainy squirrel had done it again, for in a darkened room miles from the car, a strange figure was directing their course with a number of push buttons. Unfortunately for our friends, while they were traveling forward at high speed, the figure punched a button marked reverse, and the car was immediately torn in half. Oh, fudge. Well, who is this clumsy stranger? Maybe we'll find out next time in Fender Benders or the Asphalt Bungle. Well, it looks as if our heroes have been caught between two fires this time. Not only is Boris Badenov trying to keep them away from Mount Flatten and Bullwinkle's inheritance, but now a mysterious stranger has trapped them in a speeding limousine which is remotely controlled from a spot miles away. Unfortunately, this new menace pushed the wrong button and the limousine was torn apart. Oh, crab apple. Are you all right, Bullwinkle? I reckon so. What transpired? I figure whoever was controlling this car pushed the reverse button. But where's the bottom of the car, Rock? A good question, that. For at that moment, the bottom half of the limousine was running through the country, tearing up rocks and cactus. Meanwhile, our friends courageously decided to push on to Mount Flatten, on foot, across the hot, dry, burning desert. Boy, what I wouldn't give right now for a nice, cool ice cream soda. Yeah, sure would taste good. Then suddenly a fantastic image appeared before Bullwinkle's weary eyes. Hmm, a ice cream soda. I really prefer chocolate. Uh, with two straws, please. Thanks. Now I... Rocky! Come here, look! Where? Well, don't you see it? A ice cream soda! Oh, there's nothing there, Bullwinkle. Of course there is. I'll just grab it. Oh! That's a cactus you got hold of. I would have bet it was a soda. You just saw a mirage, Bullwinkle. Hmm? You know what a mirage is. Sure, it's where you park your car. No, it's an optical illusion. Your eyes are playing tricks on you. They wouldn't do that. They're friends of mine. And the indignant Bullwinkle stalked off. Meanwhile, on top of a nearby hill, Boris was unfolding another fiendish plan. What's that, darling? Like the man says, Natasha, this is fiendish plan number 346. Now look, here are we, A. Here are Moose and Squirrel B. We fire small cannon C. Up in the air it goes. And? And lands on them just as they get to Crossroads X. X marks the spot, eh, darling? You said it, kiddo. <laughs> but at that moment, there was a sudden interruption. Boris, coming this way. What is it? 
Don't know. Looks like traveling rock garden. Of course, it was really the limousine chassis covered with rocks and cactus. It's coming right at us. Run, Natasha! Too late, for in just a few seconds, the speeding chassis caught up with the villains and roared onward as they hung on desperately. Meanwhile, high up in the air, the cannon shell whistles wildly on its way as a thousand feet below, Rocky and Bullwinkle slowly approach the fatal crossroads. Miragi, my left hind foot. Oh! Disappearing stodies. Never here to touch it. Yeah! Now look at that, Rock. I suppose you'll tell me that's a mirage. <laughs> no, <laughs> guess it was. But though Boris and Natasha had been momentarily defeated, our heroes aren't exactly out of trouble. Come on, Bullwinkle. We're bound to find some water soon. I, I can't make it, Rock. And the mighty moose, unused to the desert heat, collapsed in his tracks. Well, it looks bad and very hot for Rocky and Bullwinkle. Please hold a thought for them. Till next time when we see Burning Sands or the Big Hotfoot. Well, there was dirty work at the crossroads last time as Boris and Natasha tried to blow up our heroes. Unfortunately for them, they were caught by a runaway car and wound up blowing themselves up instead. Of course, our boys still aren't out of the woods. Uh, uh cactus. Rock, I, I can't go on. Bullwinkle, speak to me, speak to me. Why won't you speak to me? I can't think of a thing to say. Gee, I gotta get him out of this sun. And the plucky squirrel seized his friend by the ankles and began to drag him bodily across the desert floor. Ooh, ooh, ooh. If it's all the same to you, Rock, I'll walk. But, Bullwinkle, you're too weak to walk. Yeah, but I'd rather die of the staggers than get needles to death. Good show, Bullwinkle. And our friends pushed onward while the blazing sun beat down with furnace heat. A short distance away, Boris and Natasha were pulling themselves out of the debris of the explosion. Well, your plan was a washout, Boris. Duh, I think I cancel my subscription to the fiendish plan of the Mont Club. But they're getting away with deed to mine, darling. What can we do? Oh, you forget I am vice president in crime syndicate. So what you're going to do? What any big executive would do. I pass the buck. Hello, fearless leader. Come in, please. And Boris's voice crackled across the miles to a sinister hideout where his superior eagerly awaited his report. Hello? Hello? Fearless leader. Mm -hmm. Is Boris bad enough on the air, sir? Oh, no. That no good, no good. Hello, fearless leader. Don't tell me you didn't get deed to mine. Bear you lie. didn't rub out moose and squirrel. Bear you lie. just got caught in one of your own traps. How did you... Enough, bad enough. Either get results soon or join our most exclusive society. Yeah? What's that? Ex-Vice President's Club. What he say, darling? He passed Buck right back to me. Meanwhile, our heroes were just about at the end of their tether. Courage, Bullwinkle. Just a little bit farther. But I'm so thirsty. Feels like my mouth is full of lint. If we just had some water. Water? I'd give anything I got for a drink of water. My money, my house, even the deed to Uncle Dulap's mine. Water, boy. Where was I hiding? Hokey smoke, who are you? <laughs> Allow me to introduce myself, Slahib. Gonga Drain, professional Indian type water boy. Well, how much is your water? Oh, got all prices. You buy by the drop, sip, swig, or gulp. How much for a king size guzzle? Oh, for that it costs. One deed to mine. Sounds great. Will you drink it here or take it off? Well, I... Now, wait a minute, Mr. Drain. Just call me Gonga. How did you know we had a deed to a mine? Well, I... I don't think you ought to do it, Bullwinkle. Anyway, those prices seem awful high. But I got big overhead. No, some other time, maybe. Yeah, see us next time we're dying of thirst. Well, <laughs> to show there is no hard feeling, I give you free of charge Gunga Drain souvenir. Souvenir? What is it? This delightful little pet you should wear on your lapel changes color when you put it on things. Oh, yeah, I hear them. They're called chameleons. Chameleons, Bullwinkle. Yeah, cute little fellas, aren't they? But they really weren't chameleons at all, but deadly poisonous scorpions. Well, will these little stingers do Boris's dirty work for him? Be with us next time for Death in the Desert or A Place in the Sun. 
Well, on their way to Mount Flatten, where Bullwinkle's uncle had left him a mine, our heroes have run into a serious water shortage. But when Boris disguised himself as Gunga Drain, an Indian water peddler, Rocky turned him down. Yeah, it isn't as if we're dying of thirst. Cause we are. It was then that Boris offered them two free souvenirs that he said were chameleons. I don't believe it. These animals have claws. That's because they're desert chameleons. They use the claws to walk through sand. I still don't believe it. You don't believe in sandy claws? That's pretty serious, Rock. No telling what would have happened to Bullwinkle's faith in Rocky if one of the little beasts hadn't suddenly flipped his tail up and stung a nearby cactus. What did I tell you, Bullwinkle? What a way to die. Chameleons, huh? These are scorpions. Well, after all, what is a scorpion? Just a chameleon with a little kick to it. Come on, Bullwinkle. And the two boys started off across the desert again. What's the matter, darling? Trick didn't work. I was so sure they would trade deed to mine for water. You were really going to give them water, Boris. Of course, Natasha. This water, all they could drink, see? And as Boris poured a little of the clear liquid into a cup, the cup dissolved. <laughs> His little invention of my own for reducing. Reducing? Gets rid of ugly fat. People. Deeper into the blazing desert, our hero staggered. Little did they know that high above them in an air-conditioned helicopter, a mysterious figure was watching them. Suddenly, the helicopter began to descend toward our heroes. Meanwhile, a thousand feet below... Did you ever get the funny feeling that you were being followed, Bullwinkle? You, yeah, and we are. Get out of here, you buzzards! But just then, a shadow fell over our friend. Hmm, must be a cloud in the hay! A cloud in the hay? The heat's getting you, Rock. No, look! Yes, the helicopter had swooped low and was hovering right over our friends' heads. Gee, do you suppose we're going to be rescued at last? Sure, he let down a ladder, Sue. Hey, look out! Great mounds of moss! Yes, the helicopter was behaving in a very peculiar manner. Either he's a terrible pilot or he's out to get us. Nobody's that bad a pilot. He's trying to squash us like a couple of bugs. Stop, Bullwinkle! Too late. Down came the aircraft on Bullwinkle's head. And when it rose again, Bullwinkle went with it. Bullwinkle, let go! I can't! My antlers are stuck! You're what? My antlers! I can't get them loose! And the strange craft with the moose dangling from it went bounding over the countryside, much to the wild surprise of two nearby Indian chiefs. Oh, uh, some sight, eh, Chauncey? You talk straight, Edward. What do you think of it is? One of two things. What two things? Plane with crazy landing gear. Or? Moose with crazy head. Oh, Chauncey, you funny Indian. Funny Indian? Yes. Never ho, ho, ho. But it wasn't funny at all to Rocky. I gotta try to get Bullwinkle out of there. So the next time the moose touched ground, Rocky grabbed his leg and tried to pull him out. He didn't succeed. Hokey smoke, I'm up in the air. I'm not too cold myself. And the helicopter continued on its erratic up and down course over the desert. How long can our heroes take this terrible pounding? Don't fail to see our next episode, The Boy Bounders or Plain Punchy. When Rocky's friend Bullwinkle inherited a mine from his uncle, little did he think it would lead to this. <laughs> But then again, neither did anybody else. Boris, darling, what a wonderful stunt. What do you talk, Natasha? I didn't did it. But if not you, then who? Exactly what Rocky was wondering as he shouted. Can you see who the pilot is, Bullwinkle? Yeah, he's just a run-of-the-mill mysterious stranger. It was true. A masked figure was at that moment frantically twisting the control. Up sailor run, stabilize the elevator rig for diving dinghy dinghy, prepare to ditch. Boy, that is a confused mysterious stranger. That voice is awful. Familiar. Of course, that was me. I just did that. No, did... no, I mean the pilot's voice. Look out, here we go again. <laughs> oh, I'll never get out of here, Rock. Well, look, if we can't get out, let's try to get inside. Yeah. Bullwinkle struggled and strained, but to no avail. Then suddenly, both of our boys shot into the plane with no trouble at all. Hey, that was pretty easy after all. Yeah, but how come we're lying on the ceiling? Well, that's how come. Look down at the ground. Golly, Rock, it's gone. Yeah, but now look up. The sky, it's full of worlds. Don't you get it, Bullwinkle? We're flying upside down. Well, then they better get the picture turned around. Ooh. 
that's more like it. Not very much, Bullwinkle. We're falling. Hey, Mr. Pilot, we're gonna crash. You know something? I had a hunch we would. That voice. Where am I? At that moment, a gust of wind lifted the pilot's mask. Bullwinkle, it's Captain Peter Peachfog. The world's worst sailor? You wasn't supposed to guess. Grab the wheel, Rock. It's our only chance. And the plucky squirrel struggled to right the capsized helicopter, but the force of gravity pulled it lower and lower as it flew over sagebrush and cactus. Come on, Rocky! Come on, gravity! But sure enough, under Rocky's skillful handling, the plane righted itself and zoomed upward. Boy, that was too close for comfort. Yeah, too close for me, too. You okay, Captain Peach Fuzz? Of course, Rocky, but I do wish you'd turn the lights on. But it's daylight, Captain. I can't see a thing. Of course not. You've got this mask on backwards. Boy, they don't call him wrong way Peach Fuzz for nothing. You mean they gonna pay? What in the world are you doing in that outfit, Captain? Can't you tell? <laughs> I'm the new head of G2. The government's intelligence system? But why are you following us, Captain Peach Fuzz? Glad you asked. It's because of, uh, I have it written down inside my hat here. Let's see. Oh, yes, it's because of J.B. Stetson. No, no, that's the wrong label. Oh, of course it is. It's because of Bullwinkle's mind. What about it? It's just vital to our defenses, all. How come then? I'll tell you in one word. Yes? Upsidasium. Upsidasium? Shh, not so loud. So you see, we must get to that mine quickly. Full speed, a splurg, a glug, a snake, a robe, a dick. Full speed ahead! But true to his nature, Captain Peach Fuzz reached for the wrong lever, and when he pulled it, the helicopter's rotating blades flew off into space, and the stricken craft plunged earthward. Well, it looks as if Rocky and Bullwinkle have a real wrong way problem on their hands. Be with us next time for a peek at the peak, or your climb is my climb. Well, our heroes have met up again with Captain Peter Peach Fuzz, much to their dismay. For in trying to land his helicopter, the good captain pulled the wrong lever and the blades flew off into space. After that, the helicopter dropped like a stone toward the desert floor. You better bail out, Captain. I didn't know we were leaking. No, I mean you better parachute. A moment later, our friends left the stricken aircraft, and while Rocky zoomed lightly through space, two parachutes blossomed on the desert sky. Unfortunately, the captain had put his on upside down. He descended in a rather unorthodox way. As a result, all manner of things, money and papers began to rain from his pockets. Get them, Rocky! Get them! Rocky zoomed off and a few seconds later returned with a handful of greenbacks. Here you are, sir. I caught your money. Money? Who needs money? I lost my credit cards. But the credit cards weren't all that was lost, as our friends discovered after they landed. What do you mean? What else is lost? Well, I don't like to say it, Bullwinkle, but we are. Yes, hopelessly turned around since their dizzying airplane flight, the boys had now no idea of which way to go. It really doesn't matter. I've got to follow you no matter where. Follow us? How come? You yeah, and why aren't you in uniform? And Captain Peach first told his blood-chilling story. It seems that on his return from his last voyage as master of the SS Andalusia, he had made a slight miscalculation in docking. Full speed ahead! And as a result, sailed his ocean liner right into the middle of New York's financial district. I say, Bradbury, isn't that the Andalusia? Nonsense, old boy. She's not due to dock for an hour yet. As a result of a typical peach fuzz error, the Andalusia wound up wedged tightly between two tall office buildings on Wall Street. And there she remained, for it was the first time in history that financiers could take a winter vacation and watch the market at the same time. Mm, I see the barometer is down two points. Yes, and so is Universal Spleen. Matter of fact, the Andalusia became so popular that she was given an address 17 and a half Wall Street, and to this day is a trusted member of the financial community. Besides being the only banking firm with portholes. Well, that was fun for New Yorkers, but of course the end of Captain Peach Fuzz's sailing. For one day, he was piped over the side by the board of directors and summoned to a meeting of the U.S. Maritime Commission. Congratulations, Peach Fuzz. You have been promoted to Q2. Q2? What is that? Is that good? It's a big deal in the Cold War, Peach Fuzz. The Cold War? Yes. You are in sole charge of counting penguin eggs at the South Pole. But why, sir? There wasn't any place further away we could send you. And so Captain Peach Fuzz's orders were typed. But the typist, a niece of the captain's, made one little mistake. She hit a G instead of a Q, and Peter Peach Fuzz became head of G2, the American intelligence system. Immediately, he issued new orders 
All right, Agent 7, follow Agent 9, Agent 4, you watch Agent 2. Yes, inside of a week, the good captain had every American secret agent hard at work following some other American secret agent. But why, Peach Fuzz? Why? Well, it gives them a feeling of togetherness. That's all very interesting, Captain. You say trifle long. But why do you want to follow us? It is because of Bullwinkle's mine. What about it? It's vital to our defense is what about it. What's so important? I'll tell you only one word and you will know. Yes? yes. The word is upsidasium. Upsidasium? Well, that's the word, all right, upsidasium. But what in the world does it mean? We'll find out next time and You've Got a Secret or Out of Sight, Out of Mind. Well, let's see where we stand today. You lit. Bullwinkle inherited a mine from his Uncle Dewlap. A mysterious stranger high in a helicopter began to follow him and Rocky. He turned out to be Captain Peter Wrongway Peach Fuzz, the new head of American intelligence. But Captain Peach Fuzz is still up to his old Wrongway tricks, and he almost immediately wrecked the helicopter. Everybody got down to earth all right, but now they're all lost in the middle of the, uh, uh what desert is this? I don't know. You got a map, Bullwinkle? Nope. Maybe Captain Peach Fuzz knows where we are. Of course I do, Bullwinkle. I have a map right as uh, it. Oh, dear. What is it? My papers. They're all gone. Then nobody knows where we are. Not quite true, for at that moment, not too far away, that notorious reprobate, Boris Vadanov, was picking up all of Peach Fuzz's papers. Hmm, there's driver's license, expired 1926, and here is map of desert, and right next to this little, li who boy? What kind little who boy is that, darling? Natasha Honeybone, we hit jackpot. Is the two moose's mine? Better yet, is Peach Fuzz's identity card. You collecting auto you don't understand. Pitch Fuzz is head of G2. So? So, I merely change picture like this, and behold, the new head of G2. Oh, I can see it now, Natasha. Secret agents bring me reports. I sell them direct to consumers, no middlemen. I retail books full of secret information, $100 each. Pocket additions, 25 cents. Eventually, I set up discount houses for spies all over the world. Money will roll in. Millions. Then I'll have to do bookkeeping. Add up thousands of figures, work late at night, figure payroll deductions, pay income tax, profits, tax. Fui, it isn't worth it. Okay, but how do we get deed to Moose's mine? Ah, you forget, Natasha. They are lost. We have map. We trade. But won't they be suspicious of you? Ha <laughs> ha, silly girl. And so, just a little while later... Gee, if we could only find somebody who knows this area, somebody who lives here... Allow me to introduce myself. Who in the wide, warm world are you? Abu Ben Boris, wealthy desert chief at your service. Abu Ben Boris? Ah, you've heard of me. Yeah. Didn't your name lead all the rest one time? That's me. And this is Fatima, queen of the harem. But, but you're Arabs. What did you expect to find in Arabia, darling? Arabia? Arabia? Then this desert must be... Yes, the Sahara. Now, wait a minute. You said this is Arabia. The Sahara's in Africa. <laughs> I bought it last week. They just delivered it. Boy, he must be rich. Come this way. And the wily Boris led them to a strange-looking tent in the middle of the burning sand. Keep your eyes open, Bullwinkle. This may be a trap. I'll be careful, Rock. But just then, Bullwinkle's sharp eyes spotted somebody in the distance. Hey, what's he doing here? What's who doing here? Him. He looks to me like a strictly American-type prospector. <laughs> He's just mirage. Mirage? Of course. Optical illusion. For instance, it's broad daylight, no? Of course it is. And yet? <laughs> don't you think you see stars? Yeah, how about that? And what's more, I'm sleepy. And Bullwinkle slumped to the sands as Boris drew an evil-looking scimitar from his belt and stalked into the tent after Rocky. Oh, whatever you do, don't miss our next episode, Boris and the Blade or Chic Rattle and Roll. Well, it looks as if our friends will never get to Mount Flatten and Bullwinkle's mine, for they have just met up with their old nemesis, Boris Badanov, disguised as a wealthy desert chieftain. Abu Ben Boris at your service. What's more, on the pretext of showing him a mirage, Boris has sent Bullwinkle to Dreamland, drawn a wicked-looking sword, and followed Rocky and Captain Peach Fuzz into his tent. Can you lead us out of this desert, Mr. Abu Ben Boris? <laughs> Call me Benny. Well, can you? You said it, Effendi. Well, let's get started, then. There's only one little hitch. What's that? You ready to pay? Pay? 
Where's all that desert hospitality I've heard so much about? Oh, I'm hospitable. You can stay as long as you like, free from charge. But what if we want to leave? And we do. Then you pay. Very well. Here's all the money I have. Money. Who needs money? We do, darling. Shut up your veil, Fatimi. Well, what do you want? Hmm. You got any other valuables? Jewels? Deed to mines? Deed to mines? I'm just spitballing, you understand? Yeah, we got one of those. Well, then we're in business. But it belongs to Bullwinkle. No, so quick we're out of business. Say, where is Bullwinkle? Oh, he's right out there. Sure enough, Bullwinkle was right out there, out like a light. Bullwinkle, old pal, speak to me. Howdy, stranger. Stranger? Bullwinkle, it's me, Rocky. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Rocky. He doesn't know me. Bullwinkle, don't you remember? We're on the way to your Uncle Dulap's mine. Mine? Sure. Don't you have the deed? You know, you're pretty nosy for somebody I just met. Rocky, I do believe he has amnesia. Yeah. Never mind that. Does he have deed to mine? Looks like we'll never know, Boris. He's lost his memory. If they don't have deed to mine, who needs them? Well, we must be off. But you can't leave us to perish in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Watch carefully. <laughs> and with one mighty swipe of his scimitar, Boris cut the guy ropes of the tent. Instantly, it collapsed on Rocky and Captain Peach Fuzz. Well, now they can't follow us. Let's go, Natasha. I'm the sneak of Erebi. And the two villains hurried off across the desert, leaving our heroes floundering under the folds of canvas. But at that moment, one of the tent poles toppled over and struck Bullwinkle on the head. Goodness, I must have overslept. Hey, who's in there? It's us, Bullwinkle. Get us out. With a surge of mighty moose muscle, Bullwinkle lifted the whole tent up and Rocky and Captain Peach Fuzz emerged, none the worse for wear. Hiya, Rock. Bullwinkle, you recognize me. You got your memory back. Your mind isn't a blank anymore. Well, let's not go overboard, Rocky. I knew we shouldn't have trusted those two. You know, I bet they weren't Arabs at all. They were just after the deed to your uncle's up to daisy of mine. Yeah, where is the deed, Bullwinkle? Where I always put things for safekeeping. Where's that? Behind my left antler. Hooray! You got the deed that they were after. Now let's follow their footsteps out of this desert. And a hearty little band began to follow Boris and Natasha's footprints in the sands of crime. Unfortunately, as they marched across the shifting dunes, the wind began to blow harder. Bullwinkle, the wind is erasing their footprints. Yes, in just a gusty minute, there wasn't a trace of a footprint to follow, and our friends were once more completely lost in the desert. Will they survive the rigors of the desert night? Be with us next time for Sourdough Squirrel or Hard Rock Rocky. Last time you remember, our friends were stranded in the middle of the desert with the sun setting fast. Well, they shivered their way through the long, cold night and in the morning gazed out over miles and miles of miles and miles. Where do you suppose we are, Rock? We're right in the middle of nowhere, Bullwinkle. Oh, I'm glad. I thought for a minute we were lost. It was at that moment that Captain Peach Fuzz made a momentous discovery. Rocky, Bullwinkle, look here. What is it, Captain? Well, if we weren't in the middle of the Sahara Desert, I'd say it was a railroad track. <laughs> that you went on you. What do you mean, Bullwinkle? Well, that's just a mirage. Mirage? No, mirage. It's called a octopus illusion. Optical illusion. Yeah, it's not really here. Look, I'll kick it. Boy, that's what I really call a mirage. Hard as a rock. And look, coming down the track. Sure enough, as the boys watched, an express train bore down on them like like an express train. Get off the track, Bullwinkle. Nonsense, Rock. It's all part of the same mirage. That's not a real engine. No. I'll prove it. I'll stand right here while it goes by. And Bullwinkle stood directly between the rails as the engine hurtled toward him. In the locomotive cab, of course, panic reigned. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Chauncey. What's that, Edgar? A moose waving at us from the tracks. Oh, I don't know, Edgar. Mooses are always pretty friendly. No, I guess you're right. I'll toot back. Boy, that sure looks like a real train to me, Bullwinkle. Come to think of it, I never did hear of a mirage with a whistle. Look out, Bullwinkle! And Rocky launched himself through the air and at the last possible instant knocked <sighs> Bullwinkle out of the way. Gee, that was close. You, yeah, they don't make mirages like they used to. Halt! Halt, I say! If we must stop that train, Rocky. It's the only way we'll get out of this desert. Right. Bullwinkle, if you'll give me a little altitude, I'll try to catch it. Okay, Rock. And as Captain Peach Fuzz watched in amazement, Rocky held himself rigid and Bullwinkle picked him up like a javelin. Put my little weight there, Rock. 
Then Bowwinkle took a short run and with a mighty heave tossed Rocky high into the air. As soon as he gained enough altitude, the plucky flying squirrel headed downward straight for the speeding train. I tell you, that boy is a flying fool. Rocky drew up even with a locomotive and tried to fly into the cab. Unfortunately, he misjudged his distance a trifle and flew right through. Hey! Did you see what I saw, Chunsy? I hope not, Edgar. It looked like a flying squirrel. Hey! Stop the train! You know what, Chauncey? Hmm? I think we've been on this run too long. How's that, Edgar? If the squirrels have started following us... Yes? We must be nuts. Right. Ta-ta, Edgar. Bye-bye, Chauncey. And the two terrified engineers leaped from the cab of the speeding locomotive. Golly, looks like I got here just in time. Rocky threw the brakes on hard and the train ground to a halt. A few moments and several explanations later, the engineers were back in the cab and our heroes safe on board the train as it started westward again. Well, we're on our way again, Rock. And this time, nothing can go wrong. Well, it better or people will stop watching the show. No such chance, for at that moment, just a little way ahead, Boris Badenov stands at a switch that, if thrown, would immediately derail the train. But why, Boris? Moose and squirrel are on board. But what about all the other passengers? Well, <laughs> you can't make an omelet without breaking. Making eggs. And the fiendish Boris pulled that fatal lever. Don't miss our next exciting episode, A Creep at the Switch or Sudden Pacific. On the perilous path to Mount Flatten and Bowwinkle's mine, Rocky and Bowwinkle wound up on board a train crossing the desert. With them is Captain Peter Peachfuzz, the muddle-headed head of G2. Yes, Rocky, I've been following you and Bowwinkle for days now. Why? Because I'm lost. But you must have another reason. Well, actually, it's your mind, Bullwinkle. What about it? It's chuck full of upsidasium. Upsidasium? Gee, that's great. Marvelous. What is it? I can't tell you. Can't tell us? But the mind's mind. Mind's mind. Surely you can give us a little hint. Well, all right, but just a hint. And Captain Peach Fuzz told them a strange story indeed. It started several years ago in a little western town of Buzzard's Craw when a grizzled old prospector trudged into town leading his pack mule. He looked like any other grizzled old prospector, but his burrow was just a little bit different. It floated along behind him 20 feet in the air. Looks like Henry has made a strike, Zeb. How you figure? Look how uppity his mule is. The grizzled old prospector pulled his burrow in like a kite, hitched him to a rail, and entered the claims office. Calvin, I want to file a claim on Mount Flatten. Strike it rich up there, did you? Yep. Gold? Nope. Silver? Nope. What then? Don't know, but there's sure a lot of it up there. Did you bring any back, Henry? Did I? Look at that fool mule. He's carrying a load of it. You mean? Yep. I figure it's some anti-gravity metal. Anti-gravity? What's that mean? <laughs> it means the stuff falls up. Impossible. But at that moment, the town sneak thief, Scurvy McMurk, was rifling the old prospector's pack. Oh, boy, I got me a big chunk of... <laughs> And McMurk, still holding a piece of the mysterious ore, shot skyward and was never seen again. And good riddance. Hmm. We better send that stuff to the assay office in Durango. And a few days later at the assay office, the chief assayer, Dr. Sebastian Flegel, held a press conference. Gentlemen, in this heavy chest, we have the world's first anti-gravity metal. Down, boy. Scientists call it a phosphoric butyl acehedron of axium disulfide. We call it obsidasium. Obsidasium? Now, let's have a look at it, Doc. Impossible, gentlemen. Not even to get your picture in a paper. Well, all right. <laughs> but you have to be awfully quick. And as the doctor opened the heavy lid, the world's entire available supply of upsidasium fell up and out of the chest, crashed through the ceiling, and disappeared into space. Would you like me to say cheese? Meanwhile, back in Buzzard's Craw, the grizzled old prospector was in for a severe disappointment. Uh, you can't file a claim on Mount Flatten, Henry. How come? Because Mount Flatten is already owned. By who or? By a moose. A moose? Dewlap D. Moose. <laughs> What's so funny, Henry? Cause he'll never find Mount Flatten is why. Why so? Cause it ain't nowhere to find. <laughs> and the grizzled old prospector stalked out of the office and out of the story. And so you see, the government has been looking for Mount Flatten ever since. A lost mountain, hokey smoke. Well, we'll all look for it together. Yeah, a whole mountain shouldn't be too hard to find. Oh no? And what if the train you're on is speeding toward an open switch? And that's just what's happening now as Boris Badenov gleefully awaits the catastrophe. My, how time flies when you're having fun. Don't miss our next episode, The Train on the Plane, or 
the Overland Express. Last time our heroes learned from Captain Peter Peach Fuzz, the new head of G2, the strange story of Upsidasium, discovered on the slopes of Mount Flatten by an old prospector. This fabulous anti-gravity metal had set scientists on their ears until the entire world's supply had been lost by accident. Not only that, but when the old prospector learned that the mountain was already owned by Bullwinkle's uncle, he said... Well, he'll never find it. Why not? Because it's nowhere to find. Gee, a lost mountain. And now it's all yours, Bullwinkle. Yeah, it's the nicest present I never had. On to Mount Flatten, hey, fellas? Well, almost anyway. For on the track ahead, Boris Badenov waited beside an open switch. Boris, darling, why are you wrecking trains? He's on train, moose and squirrel. They won't give us D to hop sedasium mine, so... You got orders from Central Control? You think I can't make my own decisions? You think I'm just a stooge for Central Control? No. Oh, darling. Well, you're wrong. I am. Hello, fearless leader, old body boy, old chum, old sweetie pumpkin. Come in, Bedenov. Is this fearless leader? Of course. Are you sure? Bedenov, you incompetent nincompoop. <laughs> That's him, all right. Fearless leader, switch is open, train is coming, okay? One moment, I check with Mr. Big. Mr. Big? This must be top level caper with Anastasia. Achtung! Yes, yes, yes! Mr. Big says, follow moose and squirrel to mine. Do not wreck train. Do not! <laughs> Quick, Natasha, pull switch back! He's stuck, darling, I can't! And the two villains tugged vainly at the switch lever as the train drew nearer and nearer. No use, Boris, it won't work! Natasha, we got to stop train! And Boris dashed up the track toward the onrushing locomotive. Hey, stop! Track is out! You who stop the train! Wait, oh boy! Inside the cab of the locomotive, the alert engineers heard Boris's cry. Hmm, sounds like someone shouting, stop the train, Chauncey. Uh-huh. I think he said the track is out. Oh, you know how some people are. Pessimistic. Mm, that's right, Chauncey. Let's see, did I discard or not? Fortunately for everybody concerned, somebody else heard Boris's bellows. Hey, there's someone standing on the tracks waving a red claw. Must be practicing to be a bullfighter. No, that's a warning to stop. But we're not stopping. Well, there's one way to fix that. Pull the emergency cord, Bullwinkle. And Bullwinkle did just that. Instantly, the brakes went on, the wheels locked, and the passengers went flying. We're saved, Rocky. Yeah, I wonder who the hero was that flagged on the train. Probably some grizzled old prospector. You're absolutely right. Allow me to introduce myself. Mojave Max, G.O.P. G.O.P.? Grizzled old prospector. This is my sidekick, Death Valley Dati. Howdy, partner, darling. Say, Rock, maybe they could help us find the lost mountain. Bullwinkle, that's top secret. You lost something, darling. Yeah, but I'm not allowed to tell you what. Is it uh, bigger than Kumquat? Yeah. Smaller than Texas? Yeah. I know, it's a lost mountain. Hey, that's right. She's pretty good at that game, Rock. Just the same, we better get back on the train and yike! Okay. I never yiked on a train, but... Look, Bullwinkle, it's leaving without us! Yes, the train was going on its way, leaving our heroes, our heroes, mind you, at the mercy of Mojave Max and Death Valley Dottie. Don't miss our next thriller, Danger in the Desert, or Max Attacks. Last time, as you undoubtedly recall, Boris and Natasha popped up disguised as Mojave Max, a grizzled old prospector, and his sidekick, Death Valley Dottie. But what's even worse, our hero's train has started to leave without them. Hey! Why are they going without us, Rock? I'm sure I don't know. Well, we do, don't we? For there in the cab of the locomotive was Captain Peter Peachfuzz, who naturally had pushed the wrong uh, lever. Uh, uh, the brake, Chauncey. Where's the brake? Is this it? Good heavens, Edgar, we can't stop. We'll keep going forever. No, I figure we'll stop in Albuquerque. Why? There's a big stone wall at the end of the tracks. Meanwhile, Rocky and Bullwinkle were still chasing desperately after the last car. Wait! Wait up! You can't go without me! I got a ticket! Unfortunately, Bullwinkle's ticket suddenly unfolded, and of course, he tripped over it. Oop! Well... There it goes. You go on and fly after it, Rock. You can still catch it. And leave my pal stranded here? Never. Gee, you're a real pal, pipe pal, Rock. Look at that, Natasha. Sometimes I wish I had a friend. Why? So I could double-cross him. You would double-cross, friend. I got to. My enemies don't trust me. 
Now I wonder how we get from here to Mount Flatten, Bullwinkle. We got a map, you know. Hey, that's right. Let's unfold it and take a look. Right. You hold this side and I'll hold this side. And I'll hold this side. Hey, Mr. Mojave Max, this is supposed to be a secret map. That's okay. I couldn't remember what was on map if I tried. I got terrible memory. Gee, that's too bad. How long have you had it? Had what? A terrible memory. There, you see what I mean? Well, maybe it's okay. Now, which way is Mount Flatten? The boys and Boris searched the map carefully, but Mount Flatten seemed to be a very elusive peak. Gee, this map is pretty useless. Maybe you can't get there from here. Nonsense, Bullwinkle. Let's just pick a direction and start looking. Right. How do we pick it? Let's just toss a pebble into the air and see which way it falls. How about this one, little fellow? Too small. How about this one? Too big. Hey, Bullwinkle, look at that rock. Yeah, it's a full-grown one, ain't it? No, they're on the side. Sure enough, Bullwinkle seemed to have accidentally discovered a primitive road marker. To Mount Flatten. Come on, Bullwinkle. At last we're going to find your lost mine. You saw it, kiddo. Let's go. You coming too, Mr. Mojave Max? We better let him, Bullwinkle. We don't know anything about mining. That's right. Maybe he'll help us. And our boys started little realizing that Boris is more likely to help himself to their mine. See, your partner's got quite a load there. Don't you have a mule? No. But I thought all grizzled old prospectors had a mule. Yeah, we got a low-budget show. Ooh, well, let me give you a help there, Death Valley, Dolly. Mighty kind of you, partner, darling. Hey, there's another direction marker. We're going the right way, all right. And there's another one right up there. Oh, boy, we're getting closer, Natasha. But as they drew near the last marker, the boys made a horrifying discovery. Bullwinkle, the arrow's pointing back the way we came. You mean we missed it? We must have. But looky, there's no mountain anywhere around here. Well, whoever said Mount Flatten was a lost mountain apparently wasn't kidding. What will our heroes do now? Well, if you think of anything, let us know, won't you? And be sure to be with us next time for The Missing Mountain or Peekaboo Peak. Well, our heroes are slowly closing in on the Lost Mountain and Bullwinkle's Upsidasium mine. They found some primitive markers in the desert pointing the way to Mount Flatten. But to their dismay, the last marker pointed back the way they had come. Anything I can't stand is a signpost that talks back to itself. But this means we must have passed Mount Flatten. Passed it? Look back the way we came. No mountain there. Yeah, it's pretty flat, all right. You don't suppose somebody buried it accidental like? Not a whole mountain. Now, let's think. Boris, darling, what do you suppose happened to mountain? Simple, Natasha. Somebody stole it. Boris, who would ever steal an enormous mountain? I would. Bullwinkle, I think I got it. I'm all ears, Rock. Except in front, where I mostly nose. If Mount Flatten isn't back there... And it isn't. And it isn't ahead there. And it isn't. And it isn't down there. Obviously, Dalek. Ergo, it must be up there. <gasps> oh, for gunny sacks. Yes, incredible though it seemed, there, hovering miles over their heads, was an enormous, regulation size official mountain peak. So that's Mount Flatten. No wonder it's not on the map. But how come it's up in the air? Well, that's easy, Bullwinkle. up sedasium. And a coochie-coochie to you, too. But why... I mean, Mount Flatten is full of that anti-gravity metal, up sedasium. You hear, Boris? You said it, Natasha. Upsidasium. This time we hit jackpot. What next, darling? What else? Get rid of moose and squirrel. No, the only thing to worry about is how to get up there. I'll handle that, Rock. Getting us up there? No, worrying about it. Well, you give me a start and I'll try flying up, Bullwinkle. Right. Let's go. Ellie! Boop! And Bullwinkle launched Rocky high into the air. Up, up, up he went, nearer and nearer to the bottom of Mount Flatten. Then as his momentum slackened, he flew slower and slower. Golly, I'm going to stall out. And stall he did, just inches from his goal. Next time I ought to do it, Bullwinkle. Oh, he didn't, did it? Next time he might, we must stop him. How, darling? Observe, Natasha. A villain's best friend. Old abandoned mine chef. He's deep, darling. <laughs> Listen. And Boris picked up a pebble and dropped it into the shaft. Three minutes later, the pebble still hadn't hit bottom. Oh, that should be deep enough. 
But how you'll get them in? Easy, I changed sign. And quickly, Boris replaced the danger sign on the shaft with one which said, elevator, up only. Then the two villains retired to see if their plan would work. Boris, what kind of idiot would try to go up in elevator shaft that goes only down? That kind of idiot. Hey, Rocky, our problem is solved. Here's the elevator Boris, that... Boris, don't do it! Don't do what? That! Rocky! And the fearless squirrel zoomed down the shaft after his friend. Instantly, Boris leaped from his hiding place and boarded up the entrance to the mine shaft. Oh, Boris, you are one smart fiend. Only one thing, darling. Hmm. How we're going to get up to mountain. <laughs> Easy. Moose throws squirrel up, squirrel throws rope down. Then I... I... Ay, 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 I got to save them. And Boris flew to the mine shaft just an instant too late. What was that, darling? Only one thing makes noise like that. What? Moose on the rocks. Is Boris Betanov right again? We'll see next time in Go Down, Mooses, or The Fall Guy. Last time, you remember, Boris fixed up an abandoned mine shaft to look like an elevator. It was a clever booby trap, and it trapped a pretty clever booby. Hey, Rocky, your problem is solved. Bullwinkle, don't do it. Don't do what? Yes, Bullwinkle plummeted down the mine shaft, and Rocky followed in a desperate effort to save him. Then Boris quickly boarded up the shaft. Two boobies with one trap. That's real economy, Natasha. But now how do we get up to Mount Flatten? Too late, Boris realized that with Rocky gone, he had lost his means of reaching the mysterious floating mountain. Quickly, he dashed to the mine shaft, but seemed to be just a little late. Oh, boy, I bet that hurt. But what Boris had heard was merely the sound of boulders loosened by Bullwinkle's fall, for the moose was still dropping through space with Rocky close behind. There's only one thing to do, Bullwinkle. Yeah, and I'm doing it. What's that? I'm falling. No, I have a plan. And Rocky zoomed downward in the darkness ahead of Bullwinkle. Reaching the bottom of the shaft, he judged the speed of Bullwinkle's fall and at precisely the right moment leaped upward with all of his might and met the moose's huge bulk in midair. <laughs> Stunned and shaken, but still sound of wind and limb, Bullwinkle easily dropped a short distance to the bottom of the shaft. That was a great idea, Rocky. Uh, Rocky, where are you? Alas, no voice answered, and at the bottom of the shaft, a silent form lay sprawled on the stones. Rocky, buddy, speak to me. Don't tease old Bullwinkle. Say something. Something? Well, that's something. Meanwhile, Boris and Natasha were peering down into the darkness from the top of the shaft. What we do now? What else? We play taps. But I don't have bugle. Fake it, fake it. Dom de dom, dom de dee, dom de dom, dom de dom, dom de dee. Hey, stop that singing and dancing up there. Boris, listen. Get us out. Who do you suppose that is? Well, it's not Ghost of Christmas Past. Quick, Natasha, the rope. Here, Dalek. Not that rope, the rescue rope. And a few moments later, our friends were pulled safely out of the abandoned mine shaft. Boy, somebody sure played a dirty trick on us putting that sign up. You just didn't read the fine print. What fine print? Here, use my magnifying glass. What is it, Rock? It says, out of order. Well, I guess it was really my own fault then, hmm? Now let's get up to Mount Flatten, shall we? A good idea. Ready, Bullwinkle? I guess so. Harry! Oop! And once again, Rocky flashed upward toward the bottom of Mount Flatten, miles above, while Bullwinkle and the two villains waited anxiously below. I can't watch, Natasha. You nervous, darling? No, sun is in my eye. Higher and higher the flying squirrel went, and this time... Yes! 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 He made it! Hooray! In no time at all, Rocky had lowered a long, long rope, and Boris, Natasha, and Bullwinkle began their climb upward. A couple of hours later, the two villains reached the top. So this is Mount Flatten. I wouldn't have known the old place. You've never been here before, darling. That's why I wouldn't have known it. Now I wonder which way to Bullwinkle's mine. You know, I've been thinking, Natasha. All right. Who gets double-crossed? Moose owns Obsidasium mine. We need moose. Right. But now we're up here. Who needs squirrel? Moose needs squirrel. He don't count. And Boris blithely began to push a huge boulder from its resting place on a ledge just above our unsuspecting hero. Well, this business is full of headaches. Be with us next time for Rocky and the Rock or Braver and Boulder. Well, they made it. 
Our heroes have finally found Mount Flatten, the floating mountain where Bullwinkle's Upsidasia mine is located. But it isn't clear sailing yet, for they have been accompanied by two grizzled old prospectors, Mojave Max and Death Valley Dotty, who strangely resemble those two arch villains, Boris and Natasha. Hey, loudmouth! Not so loud! Uh, last time, as a matter of fact, Boris began to push a huge boulder over on the unsuspecting Rocky. Boris, do you think this is fair? Of course not, Natasha. Why else would I do it? Little did Boris know that the enormous stone was chock full of upsidasium, the fabulous metal that defies gravity. So when it was rolled over the ledge, instead of landing on Rocky... Boris is falling up! Hmm. You can't trust anybody anymore. Yes, that huge stone fell upward until it was lost from sight. Rocky, of course, was unaware of Boris's attempt on his life. Bullwinkle, we gotta let Captain Peach Fuzz know we found Mount Flatten. Yeah, I suppose you're right. But how? Just what? Sure enough, in a very short time, a series of smoke clouds were rising from Mount Flatten. Keen idea, eh, Bullwinkle? Yeah. <coughs> Then how come all the smoke? We're sending smoke signals. Oh. You hear that, Natasha? We must stop them. But why? As soon as they send message, place will be jammed with every Tom, Dick, and J. Edgar in country. Then how can we steal Obsidasium? You're right, darling. What we do? Follow me. And Boris and Natasha climbed to a ledge directly above Rocky and Bullwinkle and began censoring the smoke signals. <laughs> Fortunately, they were just a little too late, for miles away from Mount Flatten, two lonely Indians sat on their pintos and gazed silently at the rising smoke clouds. Then one noble savage turned to the other and said, Now there's something you don't see every day, Chauncey. What's that, Edgar? Smoke signals in English? Hmm. Doesn't spell very well, does he? What's he saying? Oh... Just some nonsense about a floating mountain full of upsidasium and... Upsidasium. Last one back to the teepee is a blunt arrow. And the two Indians galloped off to see their medicine man. All right, stick them out, tongue. Say how. How? Oh. Don't get up, Doc. Just came in to use the phone. In a flash, the word spread all over the country. X3, squirrel discovers floating peak. Upsidasium, no national resource. Anti-gravity discovery rocks nation. In no time at all, Upsidasium, the anti-gravity metal, had become the most sought-after metal in the world. Think, gentlemen, of what an anti-gravity substance will mean. Upsidasium vacuum cleaners for lighter housework. Upsidasium auto, save on tire repair. Upsidasium soap, a facelift with every lather. Even the children caught the upsidasium fever. London Bridge is falling up, falling up, falling up. Soon the entire country knew about Rocky and Bullwinkle's sensational discovery. Back at Mount Flatten, our friends were surprised to find that they'd become quite a tourist attraction. They liked it. But Boris didn't. All those people looking at us, I feel like goldfish. An honest goldfish. How can we steal Upsidasium with all those people staring? We can't, so we go them one better. How? Oh. We steal mountains. Well, this plan tops anything that Boris has done. You know my motto, never steal anything small. Don't miss our next episode, Mountain Mover, or Boris Sneaks a Peak. Last time you remember, Rocky and Bullwinkle finally got to Mount Flatten and started looking for Bullwinkle's mine. Rocky wanted to notify Captain Peter Peachfuzz, head of the intelligence system, of their discovery. So he and Bullwinkle sent out smoke signals telling all. The news spread like wildfire. In no time at all, everybody in the country knew of their sensational discovery. Everybody but the man their message was aimed for, Captain Peter Peachfuzz. The reason? Captain Peachfuzz was just too good at keeping secrets. Very well, Agent Nine, your report. Well, I... Uh... Hush, that's a secret! Even from me. Agent 7? Well, I... Uh... Tut, 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 that's classified information now ready for assignment. Yes, yes sir. sir. Agent 6, follow Agent 4, Agent 4, follow Agent 2, and Agent 2. Follow Agent 6. Are you mad? Two never follow six. Meanwhile, back at Mount Flatten, the floating mountain, Boris Badanov, disguised as a prospector named Mojave Max, had his problems too. Too many tourists, Natasha. What can we do about it? Think big, Natasha. We steal mountain right from under their noses. But how? Simple. First rent airplane and then... Unaware of their shenanigans, our heroes, Rocky and Bullwinkle, were still trying to find the lost Upsidasium mine. You remember how to tell Upsidasium, Bullwinkle? How to tell it what? No. Upsidasium is the only stuff in the world that falls up. Oh, of course. How typical of me to forget. And our heroes set to work with pickaxes. Gee, here's the pretty stone, Rocky. Does it fall up? Nope. Then forget it. Okay. 
But as our friends labored steadily, a rickety craft flew steadily toward the floating mountain, and guess who was at the controls? Oh, go on, guess. Lucky Lindy. That's right, it was Boris Badanov and his partner. But darling, how do we hook onto mountains? Use your head, Natasha. And spoil my hairdo? Never! No, no, on floor of plane is anchor. Got it, darling. When we pass mountain, hook anchor to mountain. Okay. Then we tow mountain away to Pennsylvania. But won't the moose and squirrel see us fly over? Not if we fly under. And sure enough, the wily Boris flew beneath the floating mountain out of sight of Rocky and Bowwinkle. Okay, Natasha, hook on anchor. And Natasha set the anchor firmly in the edge of the mountain. Now we pull. You got other end fastened to tail of plane? Why not, darling? I got other end right. <laughs> Natasha! In a twinkling, the unlucky Lady Louse dangled precariously under the floating mountain. Ten minutes later, a somewhat rumpled Death Valley Dottie clambered over the edge of the mountain and called back to her confederates. Now what, darling? I'll fly by again. You less who plane. Oh, Boris, you're so smart. And as Boris piloted the plane close to Mount Flatten, Natasha dropped a noose over the tail. You're so clever. You're such a genius. Such a... Oh, shut up, you mouth. Meanwhile, back on Mount Flatten, Bullwinkle's pick had struck something very interesting. Appears to be some different kind of stone. Yeah. Bullwinkle, I think we hit it. Did it hurt? No, I mean, this looks like pure upsidaisium. Oh, boy, let me get at it. And Bullwinkle seized the strange-looking stone and wrested it from the earth. <gasps> Gee, it's so light. Uh... Bullwinkle, throw it away. Well, how come? It must be worth a fortune. Yeah, but you got to be here to spend it. Sure enough, the upsidaisium was carrying Bullwinkle farther and farther into the air. Hey, I'm falling up. And now it's too late for you to let go. Will the mighty moose keep falling up forever and ever? Don't miss our next episode, Bullwinkle's Rise, or This Goon for Hire. Well, in their search for the Upsidasium mine, our heroes have finally got to Mount Flatten, the world's only floating mountain. But Bullwinkle, who unearthed a large boulder of the anti-gravity metal, soon found himself falling upward at remarkable speed. I always expected to go to heaven, but not so soon. Drop it, Bullwinkle! I can't, Rocky. I'm too high up. It was true. Bullwinkle shot higher and higher, and truly he was in a dilemma. Yeah, I dasn't hold on, and I dasn't let go. Then the brainy squirrel got an idea. If you still have your pick with you, just break some pieces off the rock. And Bullwinkle did just that. And with each piece he chipped off, his upward speed slowed and slowed until finally he actually began to move downward again. Don't chip anymore, Bullwinkle. That's just right. Boy, keeping that stuff is going to be harder than getting it. You know, I have the same trouble with money. Meanwhile, far below them, those two sneaky characters, Boris and Natasha, still disguised as miners, were now hatching still another plot to steal Mount Platten and spirit it away to Pottsylvania. You sure this will work, Boris? How could it don't work? Was invented by Uncle Wanya himself. Uncle Wanya? That grand old mean of crime. You mean grand old man of crime. <laughs> I said mean, I mean mean. Look here. And Boris showed Natasha one of his rarest treasures, an autographed copy of Uncle Vanya's collected recipes for robbers, the Fireside Crook Book. See right here, he tells how to steal mountain. Take fan A, up in balloon B, turn it on mountain C. Then wind blows mountain where you want it. Clever. You sure Uncle Wanya did it? Of course, it says right here. This plan is absolutely sure. Come. And the two villains followed the instructions to the letter. Okay. Turn on fan, Natasha. Sure enough, the huge fan blade spun at frightening speed, sending out a whirlwind of air. But unfortunately, the balloon was lighter than the mountain, and so... Boris! Fan is blowing us away! Turn it off, Natasha! Off! Off! I can't, darling! Switch is stuck! Oh, boy! And the balloon continued to dart madly about the sky. Hey, Bullwinkle, isn't that Mojave Max and Death Valley Dottie? Yeah! That's a mighty strange-looking balloon they're in. First time I ever seen one with an outboard motor. I thought this plan was absolutely sure. Says right here, absolutely sure. Turn page, darling. To fail miserably. Well, <laughs> that's one on you, Natasha. And uh, here's one on you, darling. <laughs> but Natasha's fun was interrupted when a voice crackled from their radio. Come in, Boris Bedinov, whoever you are. He's central control. Bedinov here, the schnook you love to hate. Available for wars, feuds, and all kinds of dirty deals. Go ahead. Bedinov, Mount Flatten is too big for you to handle. Too, too big? Someone is coming to take over. Take over? Stop repeating everything I say. Everything you... 
Yes, fearless leader. Uh, just who is coming to take over? Who else? Mr. Big. M -m Mr. Big? That is all. Over and out, Fedinov. He certainly is, darling. And at that very moment, a jet black jet is roaring toward Mount Flatten. Its passenger, Mr. Big. Be with us next time for Boris Bites Back or A Rebel Without a Pause. If you think you have troubles, just listen to this. Rocky and Bullwinkle have discovered a rich load of upsidasium on Mount Flatten, but because upsidasium falls up, they can't hang on to any of it. Besides that, Boris and Natasha are still going through the rogue's recipes and the fireside crookbook to discover a way to steal the whole floating mountain. And besides that, a deadly black jet is streaking their way, bearing the sinister figure of Boris's boss, Mr. Big. And besides that... And besides that, the episode is half over already. We gotta figure out how to hold on to our upsidasium, Bullwinkle. Yeah, I know everything's going up these days, but this is just silly. We need somebody who knows all there is to know about mining. Hey, what about asking Mojave Max? Good idea, Bullwinkle. And our trusting heroes started off to find Mojave Max, who in reality was their worst enemy, Boris Badenov. Well, how you be, partner? You find mine yet? Yep, and we need your help with it, Mr. Mac. What's the trouble? Well, this obsidian stuff falls up. So? So what do we keep it in? Hmm, that is problem. Let's take Squint on mine. And our heroes led Boris and Natasha right to their Upsidasium mine. This is main chef? That's right. Then problem is simple. It is? Sure. You go to bottom of chef, then soon all your troubles will be over. Great. And our heroes began letting themselves down the mine elevator. That Mojave Max seems like a good sort. Yeah. A uh, good sort of what? If Bullwinkle had only been at the top of the shaft, he would have known what. Boris, what you doing with crowbar? Well, I'm not barring cross on you, bum. <laughs> Lend a hand. The two rascals rolled an enormous stone closer and closer to the shaft. And this rock falls down. D-O-U-N-E, down. Meanwhile, Rocky and Bullwinkle were dropping deeper and deeper into the mine. Sure got dark all of a sudden. Something must be blocking the sunlight. Uh-oh, it sure is. Looky. It's a great big rock coming down at us. Again? Rocky, do you suppose we're accident prone? No time to worry about that. Let go of the rope. But we'll fall. Sure, our only chance is to stay ahead of that falling rock for as long as we can. And as Bullwinkle let go of the lift cable, the platform dropped faster and faster. Above them, the huge stone plummeted down like a... Uh, like a stone. Like a stone. Are we gaining on it? It's about even, Bullwinkle. Good. Only one thing worries me. What's that? What happens when we get to the bottom of the shaft? I hate to think, Bullwinkle. We gotta figure out something, Rock. I don't want to wind up as a mess of moose butter. At the top of the shaft, Boris was feeling very proud of himself. Natasha, you ever have one of those days where everything is wrong? Yes. Isn't it wonderful? But Boris, darling, Mr. Big is coming. You're not nervous? Mr. Big, phooey. When that creepy joy gets here, Mount Flatten will be gone. Gone? Gone where? Gone with us. We hijack Mount Boris, you going to double-cross Mr. Big? With moose and squirrel gone is easy. What kind of schnook you take me for? I give up, Badinov. What kind? Boris, look there. That huge shadow on the rock. No, not that. Yes, that. It's Mr. Big. And meanwhile, our boys are just seconds away from complete disaster. Don't miss our next episode, Bullwinkle at the Bottom or Mishmash Moose. You remember that last time we left Boris and Natasha confronted by the sinister shadow of Mr. Big himself, while Rocky and Bullwinkle were plummeting down a mine shaft followed closely by an enormous boulder. But our story really opens today in a quiet Washington office where Captain Peter Peachfuzz, head of G2, is speaking to his secretary. Get me the file on Mount Flatten. Yes, sir. Wait! Aren't you forgetting, Miss Glum? Those are secret files! Close your eyes. Then how can I see what file I'm getting? Don't you use the touch system? Well, I'll try. Let's see. It should be this drawer back about, uh... Mm. You're peeking. Well, I'll just never find the information. Then how do I know what's going on? Don't you ever watch the Rocky show? Say, there's an idea. And the captain turned on a nearby set just in time to hear... You remember the last time we left Boris and Natasha confronted by the sinister shadow of Mr. Big himself, 
while Rocky and Bullwinkle are plummeting down a mine shaft followed closely by an enormous boulder. But our story really opens today in a quiet office in Washington where... Oh, who cares? I've got to get out there. And in just a moment, Captain Peach Fuzz was in a fast plane and headed straight for... the North Pole? Meanwhile, what about Rocky and Bullwinkle? Yeah, what about us? Bullwinkle, this is the longest mine shaft I ever fell down. Yeah, we ought to be through the whole mountain by now. Well, that mighty Moose's intellect had done it again, for that mine shaft did go all the way through the mountain, and at that moment, the platform shot out the underside of Mount Flatten and into thin air, followed, of course, by the huge boulder. I'll try to swing us out from under it, Bullwinkle. The plucky squirrel zoomed down from the platform, and then as it passed him, pushed it out from under the boulder. In another instant, the platform reached the end of the rope and dangled far beneath the floating mountain, while the huge boulder continued on, clear to the ground, where it shattered into... 16 tons of instant gravel. We better get back up the rope, Bullwinkle. Can't we rest here for just a minute? But Mojave Max and Death Valley Dottie will be worried about us. Well, that was true enough, for Max and Dottie, alias Boris and Natasha, were at that moment trying to explain things to that criminal mastermind, Mr. Big. You are accusing me of double dealing? What kind of schnook you take me for? I give up bad enough. What kind? <laughs> Just fun-loving schnook, Mr. Big, sir, boss, old superior. You, you are making joke? Sure. You don't really think I double-cross my own dear commanding officer, leader, director, Pasha? Yes. <laughs> Very droll. Where are Moose and Squirrel? By now they should be at bottom of my shaft. Oh, you, you miserable idiot. This, this is a floating mountain. You mean? Yes, the mine shafts go all the way through. Sure enough, when Boris looked down the shaft, he saw our heroes dangling far below. Oh, bad enough. You have goofed. Only temporarily, Mr. Big. And opening his coat, Boris began to hunt for his favorite mine shaft rope snippers. But even as Rocky and Bullwinkle started their long climb up the rope, they were faced with still another danger. Bullwinkle, look there! It's just an airplane, Rock. Nothing to worry about. Yeah, but it's headed right for us! Now that's something to worry about. Well, there's danger above and danger below for our boys. Don't miss our next episode, Double Trouble or The Moose Hangs High. Well, our boys have managed to get themselves into double trouble as they dangle from a rope below Mount Flatten, the floating mountain. Not only is a fast plane zooming right at them, but far above, Boris Badenov is preparing to cut the rope, watched closely by his shadowy superior, Mr. Big. Why are you hesitating, Boris? Just wondering whether to cut all at once or little by little. Oh, little by little, to be sure. The fun lasts longer. So Boris just lightly nicked the outside of the rope, then watched gleefully as the strands broke one by one. <laughs> Delightful, isn't it? Oh, Mr. Big, you really know how to live. But at the other end of the rope, our heroes had more immediate problems to worry about. Hey, that plane's getting closer, Rock. Hang on, Bullwinkle. And the speeding jet roared by right underneath them. Well, thank goodness, that's over. Not quite, Bullwinkle. He's turning. Sure enough, the plane reversed itself and headed back for them upside down. I wonder who's in that plane, Search me, but it's somebody who don't know upside down from right side up. That could only be one person I know of. Captain, Captain Peach Fuzz. Fuzz. But he's a close friend. Who close if you ask me? He'll hit us next time. Well, maybe I can stop him. And Rocky launched himself through the air after the jet plane. As far above, the rope drew nearer and nearer to the breaking point. Slowly, the flying squirrel drew abreast of the roaring jet and soon saw the reason for its strange actions. The pilot was indeed Captain Peter Wrongway Peach Fuzz. Golly, he's headed for Bullwinkle again. Rocky, dear boy, why are you flying upside down? I'm not upside down. You are. Oh, well, give me a hand, Rocky. With a final burst of speed, Rocky flew right into the pilot's compartment of the hurtling jet and took over the control of the plane just in time. Boy, that was a near thing. But anyway, Bullwinkle is safe at last. Well, even Rocky can be wrong, for at that moment, at the top of the mine shaft, the rope parted. Delightful. Thank you for an enjoyable three minutes, bad enough. Any time, boss man. Down and down fell the miserable moose still clinging to the now useless rope. It's not much, but it's all I got. But at that moment, Rocky's sharp eyes spotted his plummeting figure. Bullwinkle! And Rocky aimed the jet right at his pal. Downward it flashed faster and faster and finally caught up with the moose. Bullwinkle, grab onto the tail! Right, Rock! Meanwhile, far above them, Boris was still basking in the approval of his superior. 
Perinov, you, you are a no good double crossing scoundrel. Please, Mr. Big, you'll have me blushing in a minute. And in recognition of your services, I'm, I'm going to give you a little something. Boris, darling, Moose has been saved by Squirrel. You interrupting, Natasha. Yes, Mr. Big. What were you going to give me? I'm going to give you five minutes to get rid of that Moose and Squirrel, you bungler. And the mysterious shadow disappeared from view. Okay, Miss Big Mouth. How you know they've been saved? Look down there. But when Boris looked down the shaft, he seemed strangely delighted. Look, Anibal. Sure enough, the jet plane was still roaring earthward with Bullwinkle clinging to the tail. Don't you think you're the pull out now, Rock? Bullwinkle, I am, but nothing's happening. And Rocky tucked vainly on the plane steering column as the jet flashed lower and lower. Don't miss our next fun-filled episode. Fun-filled? Jet Jockey Rocky or the One Point Landing. Well, today we discover our heroes flying along smoothly. Flying and... along smoothly? You're just looking at the picture sideways. Actually, it's like this. Oh, oh, well, good heavens. Today we discover our heroes hurtling straight down toward disaster at supersonic speed. Will that spinner? Pull her up, Rock! I am, Bullwinkle, but nothing's happening. I can't understand it, Rocky. I designed this plane myself. You did? Of course. Uh-oh, an airplane designed by Wrongway Peach Fuzz himself? Our boys are really in trouble. Yes, makes you feel good all over, doesn't it? Boris, now Mr. Big won't be mad anymore. Who cares if he's mad besides me, I mean? Me? And still the jet drew nearer and nearer the Earth. We have just one chance, Bullwinkle. Well, let's take it. If Wrongway Peach Fuzz built the controls, maybe they work backwards. You mean? Yeah, I'm gonna shove this wheel forward. What happens if you're wrong? I figure the ship will just disintegrate. Well, that's better than busting up, I guess. Go ahead. So Rocky shoved the wheel forward as far as it would go, and he was right. All right. Hooray! Hooray. Well, back to the old fireside crook book. And the two villains began to peruse their guidebook for a recipe to do away with our friends. Meanwhile, the intrepid Rocky had brought the plane to a smooth landing on the slopes of Mount Flatten. Were you scared, Bullwinkle? Me. I got nerves of steel. Then how come your fingerprints are still in the tail of the plane? Well, I got fingers of steel, too. Boy, we're sure glad you're here, Captain Peach Fuzz. Yeah, even if it did almost wreck us. We found out why this mountain floats in the air. Why? Because it's chock full of... Hold it, Rocky. You're about to give me a top secret answer, right? Well, you asked a top secret question. Come over here where we won't be observed. And Captain Peach Fuzz pulled Rocky into a nearby cave. No. Whisper it to me. This mountain is chock full of ups of daisium, 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 daisium. Good heavens, Rocky. This is tippy tippy top secret. Good thing we're alone in this cave. But Captain Peach Fuzz wouldn't have felt so secure if he had seen the huge shadow on the wall behind him. For he had accidentally stumbled on the hiding place of Mr. Big. Fortunately, Rocky sensed that there was something wrong. I don't like this place, Captain. Let's go. Sure enough, no sooner had they started off than a huge stone dropped right where they'd been standing. And look on the rock, an enormous shadow. What do you suppose it is? No doubt about it, Rocky. It's an enormous shadow. But there's nobody there. Well, then what are we worried about? Come on, while well, we still can. And Rocky and the Captain dashed quickly from the cave. There's been a lot of strange goings on in Mount Flatten, Captain. Oh, dear. Why don't we notify Washington? I don't think he'd much care, Rock. He's dead, you know. I mean, we gotta tell the government. They'll send somebody to help us. Oh, But we can't do that, Rocky. This is tippy-tippy-top secret, remember? Even from the government? And there's only one thing to do, then. And that is? If the government can't come to Mount Flatten, Mount Flatten will go to the government. You feeling all right, Rocky? Sure. It's been a tough episode, I know, but... It's the only way, Bullwinkle. We gotta figure out how to get this floating mountain back to Washington. I only got two words to say to you, Rocket Squirrel. Yes? Impossible. Well, it certainly looks that way, especially since Boris and Natasha seem to have found a good recipe in the crookbook. Oh, Natasha, this is foolproof. I'm almost ashamed to use it. Well, then. But I will, I will. <laughs> be sure to be with us next time for Plots and Plans or Too Many Crooks. Well, it's busy, busy, busy on Mount Flatten these days, for Rocky and Bullwinkle have decided to take the floating mountain to Washington secretly. Secretly? But how? Easy. We just take this jet motor out of your plane, fasten it to the mountain, and zoom! Zoom? Sure. Come on, give me a hand. But won't people notice us? Not if we fly at night. <laughs> of course. Who will ever see us at night? 
You hear that, Boris? Uh Uh-huh. They're going to fly mountain at night. Pretty clever, all right. You not worry, darling? (laughs) Not as long as I got fireside crookbook. Boris, you found recipe. Of course, right here under fiendish plans for all occasions. What we do? (laughs) Come to other side of mountain. And the two villains hurried off to their side of Mount Flatten. Meanwhile, pace for the hard-working Rocky, our friends had the jet engine set up in no time at all. Yeah, and the sun is going down, too. <clears throat> I said, and the sun is going down, too. Hey! <whistles> you know, for the sun, he's not too bright. Okay, Bullwinkle, let's go! Right, run! And the jet engine began to roar, and Mount Flatten slowly moved through the evening sky. Steering by the stars, Rocky guided the mountain across the country toward Washington. Well, this certainly proves one thing, Rock. What's that? You can take it with you. All night long, the good ship Mount Flatten pressed eastward. Then as the first rays of the rising sun struck their faces, our heroes turned off the engine. But this mountain's top secret, Rocky. How do we keep people from seeing it in the daytime? Nothing to worry about, Captain Peach Fuzz. Watch! And the brainy squirrels steered the mountain into an enormous cloud bank where it was hidden from view. Now let's get some sleep till it gets dark again. And our friends, exhausted from their all-night vigils, slept soundly. Twelve hours later... Rise and shine, everybody! Shine? I can't even glow dimly. Say, where'd our cloud get to? Sure enough, the mountain was now out in the open. Then Rocky made another disquieting discovery. That land down there looks pretty familiar. Well, it should, Rock. That's the U.S. of A. But I think this is exactly where we started from. That's ridiculous, Rocky. Ridiculous or not, when Rocky checked their position with a sextant... No doubt about it. We haven't moved an inch. Or a mountain, either. Rocky, I see something sinister in this. Why, Captain? Oh, I don't know. I just see something sinister in everything. Well, all we can do is try again. Fire away, Bullwinkle! Once more, our friends drove on through the night sky until daylight appeared. But again, when they awoke, they were still right where they started. I know what it is, Rock. What? I didn't pull in the anchor. We don't have an anchor, Bullwinkle. Well, I said I didn't pull it in. All right, everybody, life jackets to your stations. Abandon ship! Captain, Captain, why are you giving orders to abandon ship? Because, frankly, Rocky, we're sunk. No, sir, I'm not going to give up. Fire up, Bullwinkle! Okay, but I call this getting nowhere in a hurry. And a third time, the determined squirrel piloted Mount Flatten through the sky. When the dawn began to break, he once more pulled into a fog bank. Well, it's me for 40 winks, fellas. Right, Captain, or even 50. No, Bullwinkle, this time we keep our eyes open. That's no way to sleep. We won't sleep. We'll stand guard instead. And our two heroes huddled in the clammy fog, waiting for... Who knows what? Not us, certainly. Be with us next time for the cliffhanger or taken for granite. Well, we know that Mount Flatten is full of upsidasium, and that's why it floats in midair. But why does it stay in one place? Our heroes rigged up a jet engine to fly the mountain to Washington, but after eight hours of flying, they found themselves in the same spot they started from. We haven't gained an inch, Bullwinkle. Well, let's look on the bright side. What's that? We haven't lost one either. Then our friends made one last attempt at moving the mountain. All night long they flew, and as day began to dawn, pulled into a cloud bank. Top secret stuff, you know. Nobody must find out about Mount Flatten. But instead of resting after their flight, Rocky and Bullwinkle decided to stand guard, and so huddled together in the clammy fog, wide-eyed and alert, while, uh, I said wide-eyed and alert. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, Bullwinkle, do you feel anything strange? Can't see as I do. We're moving pretty smooth. But we're not supposed to be moving at all. Hey, that's right. Sure enough, the mountain was moving slowly out of the clouds and starting back the same way it had come for the third time. This is no mountain. It's a big granite yo-yo. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle. Look there! And as the fog cleared, our heroes saw the reason for Mount Flatten's antics. It's another engine pulling us back. When we went to sleep, it took us back where we started. And who were those two people? It's Mojave Max and Death Valley Dottie. Hey! Hey, you two! Boris, they're not asleep. We're caught. Oh, boy. As Julius Caesar said, Omnigalia in tres partes de visa est. Translation. The jig is up. Wrong. After him, Bullwinkle! The mighty moose pounded after the hapless Boris. But just as he was about to seize him, his false beard flew off and landed on Bullwinkle. Oop! Bullwinkle, that's a false beard! So it is! 
We better tell Captain Peach Fuzz right away. In a few minutes, they had related the whole story to the head of G2. His reaction was immediate. Away, all boats! Stand by to jettison supercargo, blast off, and charge! Captain! Did I miss anything? Captain, shouldn't we notify Washington? I told you, Rocky, this mountain is top secret. Not anymore, it's not. Looky there! Oddly enough, Bowwinkle was right, for far below, Mount Flatten was making a great impression on people of a small mountain town who were seeing it for the first time. Say, Zeke, there's a whole great big mountain floating through there. Yeah? With trees and everything. I never did see anything like it. You know, Clem, it sounds so old fired good. I plumb wish I was facing that way. Clem, there's a whole south 40 floating overhead. Reckon it's the heart fields. They've been thinking of moving. And, of course, the event did not go unnoticed on the local radio station. Sarah Gummy has broke her leg. There is a mountain floating over our town. And here's the important flash. Egg prices up to 24 cents a dozen. But eventually, word of the flight of Mount Flatten reached the outside world. Extra, extra, squirrel flies floating mountain. Rocky hits the Washington. And soon a squadron of planes flew alongside the mountain as an honor escort. Hi, fellas. Drop in any time. But not everybody was delighted with this turn of events. Bad enough. This mountain must not reach Washington. But we nearly there, Mr. Big. What could we do? Don't you remember the old motto of terrorist tech? Of course. When in doubt, blow it up. Right. Boris, you will blow up Mount Flatten. Now. Oh, boy. Well, can this mean the end of our story and our heroes at the same time? Be sure to be here next time for Supersonic Boom or the old Mount Samoverin. Well, Mount Flatten, still chock full of upsidasium, the anti-gravity metal, is on the way to Washington with Rocky, our Rocky, at the helm. Meanwhile, all is not well on Mount Flatten, for hidden deep in a cave, two familiar figures and a sinister shadow are planning to blow up the whole mountain. If, if Potsylvania can't have the obsidasium, nobody can. You're absolutely right, Mr. Big. Of course I am. Only one question. Yes? Why do we want it? Didn't you read your instructions? They were so secret, I had to burn them before I read them. Oh, then let me enlighten you. And the two villains listened in amazement as Mr. Big told them why Pottsylvania was in a pickle. It seems that some years ago, the Pottsylvanians had started manufacturing a small automobile, the Assassin 8. Okay, gentlemen, this assembly line is completely automatic. I just turn it on with this key... Now watch cars come off other end. True enough, the automation system worked perfectly. Soon, dealer showrooms were loaded with assassinates. This was a great success because they were so inexpensive. Hmm, 700 pazuzas. Love bread cost 800 pazuzas. What's the secret? This new engine, buddy, is revolutionary. What do you mean, revolutionary? I mean it revolves. But that's only squirrel in cage. What do you expect for 700 pazosas, kangaroo? Okay, I buy. Yes, everybody in Pennsylvania bought an assassinate. But the company's board of directors weren't very happy about it. Gentlemen, I got it bad news. So tell. Car number 6000 just roll off assembly line. So that's bad. Pottsylvania only got six miles roads. Six thousand cars. Six miles roads. Oh, oh boy. boy. Yes, if all the cars in Pottsylvania were put end to end, it would be a typical Sunday afternoon. The Pottsylvanian government decided to build a network of highways, but too late. The construction crews got caught in the traffic and were never heard from again. The manufacturers had tried to turn off the assembly line only to find that they'd lost the key. They exported thousands of assassinates to other countries, but they were made much faster than they could be carried away. Politicians campaigned on the issue. And if elected... I promise to solve our number one national problem, the parking problem. So every highway, street, and lane was parked solid with automobiles. In desperation, the government turned to Pottsylvania scientists. Is there no answer at all, Dr. Popova? Yes. What? What is it? Anti-gravity metal called obsidasium. How does obsidasium solve problem? Look here. We make cars out of obsidasium. Yes. yes. They lighter than air. Yes. yes. So automatically solves parking problem. Doctor, you are genius. Of course. You are national hero. Net. You are under arrest. The, why? You know too much. Oh. Gentlemen, from now on, Pottsylvania got only one goal. Find obsidasium. And if somebody else got it first? Then... 
Kaboom! Kaboom, Mr. Big? Yes, Natasha. Kaboom! Oh, boy. I could hardly wait. And, and bad enough? Yes, boss man. Don't forget to blow yourself up along with it. Well, that's bad news for Boris, but even worse news for our heroes who are standing right above him. Be with us next time for The Big Blast or A Many Splintered Thing. Well, thousands are cheering our heroes again today because they are approaching Washington, piloting a mountain full of obsidasium, the anti-gravity metal. But there are those to whom the occasion brings no joy. One of them is Captain Peter Peach Fuzz, head of G2. This mountain was a perfectly good secret, and now everybody knows it. Another is that crumb of crumbs, Boris Badenov, who has just received orders from Mr. Big to blow up the mountain and himself with it. Come, come, Badenov. Light the fuse. I haven't got all day. But, Bosman, how come I'm expandable? You, you fail to get the obsidasium, Boris. Blowing yourself up is the only honorable thing to do. You had better think fast, darling. But, Mr. Big, old beloved master, if I go, you go. What? Hmm. You have a point there, Boris. However, if you insist... No, 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 no. Put it out. Perhaps I was hasty, Boris. <laughs> you were almost hasty pudding, Chiffy Wiffy. Very well, Badenov. You, you, may, you may carry on. Mr. Big is gone again, darling. <laughs> it's nice to know that under his sinister exterior beats a heart of pure chicken. Meanwhile, Rocky had skillfully piloted Mount Flatten to a sheltered cove on the Atlantic coast. Who are all those people, Rocky? Lots of them are Washington senators, Bullwinkle. Where's their baseball suits? No, no, these are real senators. They can't play baseball. I know, they got no pictures. Well, of course, our boys got another chest full of decorations. Yay! And work started immediately on mining the mysterious metal upsidasium. It was a tough job, for every chunk of ore had to be weighted down so it wouldn't fall up and out of sight. Then the refined metal was taken into the government vault at Fort Knickknack, where it was kept under close guard. What keeps it from falling up now, Rock? Look, Paul Winkle, they got a big steel cover on top of the pile, and it's chained to the floor. Oh, who goes there, friend or foe? Do we get a choice? It's us, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, you're always welcome, Rocky. We just came to see this here. Just don't touch anything. Boy, they're tough. I'd just like to see anybody try to steal any of this stuff. He'd have to be a criminal genius. A criminal genius? Well, there's only one man we know who could fit that description. <laughs> right you are. And who is that, Boris? The, you, of course, boss man. Good. Now, listen carefully. And Mr. Big outlined his plan to a startled Boris. Oh, not that, boss. It's, it's the only way, Boris. Now, go. And so late that night, as Rocky and Bullwinkle slept, a stealthy figure crept into their room and made off with Rocky's helmet. A short time later, the guards at Fort Knickknack saw a familiar silhouette approaching them. Halt. Who's there? Hokey smoke, fellas. It's just me, your old pal, Rocky Squirtle. Oh, sure. Pass, Rocky. Now, there's something you don't see every day, Chauncey. What's that, Edgar? A mustache on a little squirrel. Oh, I don't know. Maybe he fibs about his age. Still, I wonder if he really is Rocky the Flying Squirrel. And the guard started after the disguised Boris, but Boris heard him coming, and quickly seizing a small chunk of obsidasium, he tucked it into his coat, then lifted by the anti-gravity metal, he rose into the air right before the guard's eyes. And then, as the guard left, Boris quickly cut the alarm wires. Things were all set up for the biggest robbery in history. Be sure to be with us next. I'll tell them, I'll tell them. Be with us next time for the Steel Hour or a Snitch in Time. Our story opens today in, of all places, the Up in Arms, a Washington hotel. <laughs> That figure lying peacefully in a hotel bed is our hero, Rocky. You will notice that he's wearing a nightcap instead of his usual flying helmet, and for a very good reason. The helmet was stolen by Boris Badenov, who then proceeded to the Upsidasium warehouse at Fort Knickknack, disguised as... Hokey smoke, fellas. It's me, Rocky, flying squirrel. Sure, go on in, Rocky. Yes, disguised as Rocky, Boris penetrated directly to the room containing the nation's entire supply of Upsidasium. Then he cut the alarm wires and opened the rear window. Ahoy, ahoy, out there. You swaps? Boris, what means the Navy talk? Means coast is clear. Once inside, the two spies were soon joined by the sinister shadow of that criminal mastermind, Mr. Big. Well, there is obsidasium, Mr. Big. My plan is working perfect. 
Your plan, Boris? <laughs> Sorry, bossman. I meant your plan. That's better. And look outside. Got fleet of trucks. Then let's get started. Okay, boss. Let's go. You don't understand, Boris. When I say we, I mean you. Dead figures. Come on, Natasha. Well, the villain's plan was nearly foolproof, all right. They've made only one little mistake. They forgot that Upsidasium falls up. Oop. Boris, let go of it. Mr. Big, looks like your plan is washed out. My plan, Boris? <laughs> I was forgetting. My plan. Meanwhile, back in his hotel room, we find our boy Rocky wide awake. Oh, dear. What's the matter, Rock? I can't sleep, Bullwinkle. Well, small wonder your eyes are open. No, it's all those lights outside. I need a pair of dark glasses. Why don't you paint your goggles black and... Hey, that's a great idea, Bullwinkle. I... Uh-oh, I can't. No paint? No goggles. They're gone. Somebody must have stolen them to look like me, Bullwinkle. But who wants to look like you? No offense, Rock. I don't know, but I bet it has something to do with that upsidasium. Come on. And so, in the night clothes, our heroes dashed off to Fort Knickknack. At the fort itself, Boris had come up with a cunning plan. What are you going to do with those magnets, darling? Watch, Natasha. Floor is metal, no? Is metal, yes. As I strap magnets to shoes, they hold me to floor. Obsidasium can't pull me up. Sure enough, Boris was now able to handle the fabulous metal and busily trotted back and forth loading the trucks which backed up outside the window. Of course, these magnets were very powerful. As the soldiers in the room below the storeroom found out. You seen my helmet, Chauncey? Oh, thanks. Now, where's my rifle, Edgar? I had it right... Oh, there it is. But at that moment, Natasha and Boris entered the room, followed by the bemetal General Broadbean. But I tell you, it isn't me. It's somebody else up there, General. Fantastic. This place is a military oop. <laughs> is that anything like a civilian oop? Something's going on up there, Bullwinkle. Let's go! The old man's up in the air again, eh, Chauncey? Yes, Edgar, and this time he really hit the ceiling. Of course, as soon as Boris moved, the general made a rapid descent. The guard! Call out the guard! Too late, you miserable military men. Boris Bedenov strikes again. Why, Boris, that's a poem. Now Bedenov will quickly flee. So why we don't go? Can't think of a rhyme for flee. I've got one. Be with us next time when we see Verse and Worse or Crime Without Rhyme. Well, in our perennial battle between good and evil, it seemed that last time evil in the form of Boris Badenov would score an upset victory. For Boris, disguised as Rocky himself, was determined to steal the nation's entire supply of upsidasium, the anti-gravity metal. Boris, darling, the whole thing? Of course, Natasha. Remember our motto, if it's worth stealing at all, steal it all. And with the help of the magnets fastened to his shoes, Boris proceeded to do just that. He carried bar after bar of upsidasium to a rear window and loaded them into a fleet of trucks waiting outside. Side. But how do we keep people from getting curious about trucks? Look at Neyman trucks. Clover Blossom Skunk Farms. See? Nobody will come within miles of us. Oh, that's very good, bad enough. Very good indeed. Did it? Thank you, Mr. Big. Yes, I'm glad I thought of it. Quick, darling, someone's coming. Sure enough, at that moment, Rocky and Bullwinkle were dashing toward the storeroom, followed by General Broadbean himself. What we do, darling? Truck is just outside. Quick, jump in. And the two spies leaped through the open window. Well, darling, here am I, and there are you, but where is Truck? They're not here. I know where they're not, darling. Tell me where there are. Yes, Boris, tell us both. Mr. Big, beloved superior. Did you fall too, darling? Look at this lump on my head. On you, it looks good. What was that? Yeah, of course, Mr. Big. On you, anything looks good. Meanwhile, back in the storeroom... Rocky, look at all that obsidasium. It's gone. And whoever took it didn't leave a clue. Oh, I wouldn't see that, General. Looky there. Sure enough, over by the window where Boris had dropped it in his haste was a crumpled flower. Flying helmet. Have either of you seen this before? I don't know. Could I take it out in the light? You don't have to, Bullwinkle. It's mine. And just how do you explain that hat being found at the scene of the crime? Well, I just looked up and there it was. Not you, you. Are you being smart, Moose? I don't know. There's the first time for everything. Guards! 
All right, Squirrel. For somebody so short, you'll have some tall explaining to do. Boris, they think that poor little squirrel did it. Yes. They'll send him to jail. Yes. Maybe for life. Or longer. <laughs> and the really funny thing is... Yes, yes? You stole it yourself. Where is it, Boris? Yeah, I don't know, Mr. Big. Cross my heart. Double cross my heart. But Boris wasn't the only one answering questions. A short distance away, Rocky was undergoing a severe grilling. Somebody took my helmet out of my room. And I say you stole the Absidasium. And he ought to know, Rock, he was with you the whole time. That's right, he was. I was? I haven't left your sight since I got here. So if Rocky did it, you must have did it too. Hmm. Well, that puts a different light on it. You mean you're letting me go? No, I'm putting myself under arrest. Come along, me. Hey, wait, General. What for? Somebody stole it. He's right, Rock. That stuff wouldn't just disappear into thin air. Hey, that's it, Borwinkle. Sure, I knew it was. What? It disappeared into thin air. Look there. Sure enough, there, a hundred feet above Fort Knickknack and drifting higher and higher with each passing moment, were ten trucks loaded with a precious cargo of upsidasium. We gotta do something, Rock. Yeah, but what? Well, couldn't we at least wave bye-bye? Well, so the world's supply of upsidasium is on the way to outer space. Don't miss our next episode, Truck Drivers in the Sky, or Follow the Fleet. Last time, you remember, Boris had stolen the world's supply of upsidasium and loaded it into a fleet of trucks. But he forgot that upsidasium falls up, and the whole fleet was soon floating skywards. You didn't tell me they were going by air, Boris. I didn't know myself. You mean you can't get them back? Of course, Mr. Big. Just takes a little while, is all. How long? How about 20 years? You, you won't be around that long, Boris. Oh, boy. But our heroes have also spotted the floating trucks. Look, General Broadbeam. There goes the upsidasium now. Then all is lost. We're outflanked. We'll never get it back. Don't despair, General. We'll think of something. We generally do. <laughs> you get it, Rock? I see. There's only one thing to do, Bullwinkle. Yeah, you see, he's a general. I want to try to round up those trucks. Boy, try to make a joke around here. Round them up? But you can't. They'll be out of sight in a few minutes. Then we gotta hurry. Come on. Where are we headed for? The Fort Knickknack Missile Base. And in a few minutes, Rocky was explaining his idea to the chief engineer of the missile division. So you see, if one of your missiles can boost me up in the air, maybe I can get the upsidasium back. Impossible. Orders state we can carry nose cones only. Then I guess my idea's a washout. You, yeah, unless you happen to be a nose cone. Bullwinkle, that's it. Come on. Where are we dashing to? To General Broadbeam's office. A few moments later, our heroes again stood before the missile chief. I already told you, no squirrels on missiles. Yeah, but I'm not a squirrel. Look at my orders. Hmm, the general's appointed you a nose cone, first class. Okay, man, take it away. And Rocky was hoisted nine stories into the air to the top of a huge missile. Now clear the range. Prepare to fire. Mr. Moose, will you give the countdown? Ten, nine, eight, uh... Try seven. Oh, yeah, yeah. Seven, six, uh... Hurry, Borwinkle! Rocky, it's hard enough for me to count frontwards. Yeah, but the trucks are flying away. Then I'll do it my way. Ready or not, here you go. And the huge missile began to rise slowly, then faster and still faster, while Rocky clung to the very top of it. On the ground, huge U.S. radar screens tracked the flight of the missile, but they weren't the only ones. For at a secret base in another country... Well, they're sending up great big missile, Theodore. Don't matter, Nikki. Ours are bigger. They got new shape nose cone. Ours got better shape. Nose cone is shaped like... like squirrel. Like squirrel? Well, back to the old drawing board. Meanwhile, back at the fort, some stunning news came from the tower. General Broadbeam, the missile is not responding to our signals. Impossible! See for yourself. Sure enough, the sensitive instruments showed that Rocky's missile was swinging more and more out of line. It's off course! Where is it headed? According to this chart, it's headed right for Washington. Then we must destroy it! Destroy it. But my buddy's on that thing! Don't you understand? He's headed straight for the White House! You really think he can carry the farm vote? So we have to push this button. But as the general's finger neared the destroy button, voices were raised in protest. No! You mustn't! Please! Stop! Go ahead and push! Boris Badenov. So that's who has fouled up the missile mission. Who else? 
Be sure to be with us next time for The Squirrel Next Door, our high neighbor. Well, last time we left Rocky, he was on the small end of a large missile headed up, up, and away. He was really trying to recapture ten floating trucks full of that anti-gravity metal, Upsidasium. But his plans went awry when the missile began to swing off course. <laughs> I wonder what could have gone wrong. Now that missile is headed right for Washington. Oh, he's not going to like that a bit. This is General Broadbeam calling Rocky. Come in, Rocky. Hello, Broadbeam. Call me General. Yes, sir. Now hear this. Get off the missile. We must destroy it in 30 seconds. But I'm not high enough to reach the truck. The missile is off course. It's headed for Washington. 15 seconds to destruct. Rocky, what are you doing? I'm going to try to fix it. And the plucky squirrel worked feverishly on the controls of the speeding missile. 10 seconds. Come on, Rocky. Then slowly the missile changed its angle. Five, four, three, two. He's on course. He made it. Hooray! Hooray! Fooey. A few seconds later, the missile had reached its highest point and Rocky launched himself into the rarefied air. Quickly, he zoomed after the floating trucks and with lightning speed and a handy length of rope, he began to tie them together. Well, he's got them together, but how'll he ever get them down? You just leave that to my pal. He's the brains of the outfit. What does that make you? What else? A executive. Meanwhile, high above, Rocky had finished tying the trucks into one big traffic jam in the sky. Now if I can just get the last truck to work. Sure enough, as Rocky raced the engine of the truck, the exhaust acted like a tiny jet, and the string of trucks began to move downward. As the trucks came lower and lower, victory seemed within easy reach. But suddenly... Pokey smoke, I'm out of gas! And without the truck exhaust to push them earthward, the trucks full of upsidasium began to drift skyward again. Bullwinkle! Let him go, Rock! No use making a federal case out of it! But it already is a federal case! Yeah, that's right. Well, what do we do? Tie a heavy rope to a rock, Bullwinkle. Got it. Now what? Throw the rock over the trucks. Quick. Nonsense. Nobody can throw a rock that far. I'll have you know you are speaking to the winner of the Frostbite Falls Annual Rock Chunkin' Contest. Oh. Of course, this isn't the annual rock, but here goes. <laughs> and the Mighty Moose chunked the rock high into the air. Up it went trailing a heavy rope behind it. Over the trucks it flew and down on the other side. In a flash, the rope was seized by the alert ground crew of the missile, who then proceeded to haul the trucks down out of the sky. Good throwing, Bullwinkle! Oh, that was nothing. You ought to see my slow curve. But I can't understand why that missile went off course. General Broadbean didn't have to wait long to find out. General, sir, the missile control rear flap has been sabotaged. Sabotaged? How can you tell? Because the differential feedback response is negative. Yes. The molecular orbit is out of phase with the thermocouple. Yes. And besides, it has this monkey wrench in it. Good thinking, Armsby. That's done. Yeah, who could have done did it? Do you have anybody new working here? Just one man, Private. Too late, for that particular private had just gone AWOL. After him! Well, will Boris escape again? And what has become of Mr. Big? Oh, don't worry. I'm still in the plot. Be sure to see our next episode, The Spellbounders, or Hex Marks the Spot. Well, it looked for a while as if our heroes really had it made, didn't it? They discovered the floating mountain full of upsidasium and flew it to Washington in spite of the attempts of Boris and Natasha to stop them. Fui, foiled again. That's curses foiled again, darling. Please, Natasha, this is kiddie show. But things began to go wrong when Boris disguised himself as Rocky in order to steal the upsidasium. And although he failed in his nefarious attempt, he did manage to escape disguised as a famous general. Don't worry, I shall return. But in escape he had left our heroes at the mercy of his superior, Mr. Big. Gentlemen, I'm afraid your hour has come. Mr. Big has spoken. Our hour has come? Is that standard time or daylight saving? Bullwinkle, we gotta rush him. Rush him? I can't even see him. Just that shatter on the wall. The light's coming from over that way. He must be there. There's no use whispering, gentlemen. You hit him high, I'll hit him low. I must bid you good... Now, Bullwinkle! And our brave boys hurled themselves directly at Mr. Big. <laughs> Winkle's effort to hit him high failed when he hit the opposite wall. I must have gone right through him. But Rocky's hitting him low had better luck for he crashed directly into Mr. Big? Bullwinkle, look at 
Pharaoh. That's Mr. Big. Why don't you pick on somebody your own size? He is the littlest thing I ever did see. But how come your shadow looks so fierce? Oh, that was quite easy. I just did this in front of the light. The shadow of the gun was supposed to frighten you away. Well, we were a little scared. Then why did you attack me? Because we were a little stupid, too. Well, looks like it's the end of the trail, Mr. Big. Not quite, my fuzzy friend. Grab him, Bullwinkle! Too late for Mr. Big dash between Bullwinkle's legs and out of the room. You let him get away, Bullwinkle! If I was just knock-kneed instead of bow-legged, I'd have got him. Quick, after him! But with astounding speed, the tiny figure of Mr. Big dashed down the hallway toward the main upsidasium vault. He's gonna get to the upsidasium, Rock! I don't think so, Bullwinkle! Look what's in front of the vault! Sure enough, two brawny military policemen stood guard before the door armed with heavy nightsticks. But when they tried to stop Mr. Big, they succeeded only in knocking themselves out. <laughs> at last I have arrived at my goal, the world's entire supply of obsidasium. Meanwhile, in the Fort Knickknack guardhouse, General Broadbeam was still trying to prove to the Provo Marshal that he wasn't an imposter. Just take this examination. But I'm a general. Look at these stars. You might have bought them at the five and ten. That's where I got my eagles. But confounded bogus, you know me. What makes you think so, stranger? Stranger? Bogus, you're my brother. Sentiment will get you nowhere, fella. Now, just answer these questions. And in the meantime, the genuine imposter, Boris Baranov, was having the time of his life. Left column march, right column march. Boris, we got to go. Oh, please, Natasha, I'm just crazy about giving orders. Darling, you just crazy, period. The scene review. And Boris would have had a delightful afternoon if a voice hadn't suddenly called. Hey, General, sir. Uh-oh. -oh. I don't like to interrupt you, General, sir, but that Mr. Big Feller is in the Upsidasium vault. Hmm. Well, I tell you what we're going to do. You two stand over here against the wall. What's he doing, Rock? I don't know, but remember, he's a general. Yeah, maybe he's got a plan. And Boris certainly did, for he stood before a line of soldiers and commanded... Left face, ready, aim, fire! And a volley of rifle shots rang out. Don't miss our next exciting episode. Bye-bye, Boris, or farewell, my ugly. Well, last time we left things in a pretty pickle indeed. General Broadbeam was in the guardhouse taking an examination to see if he was sentenced to the jute mill or the rock pile. The villainous Mr. Big was alone in a vault full of precious upsidasium, and our heroes, Rocky and Bullwinkle, had just been placed in front of a sinister-looking wall by none other than Boris Badenov, disguised as... General Badenov, please. Okay, boys. Left face, ready, aim, fire! A volley of rifle shots rang out and our boys would have been in a bad way but for one thing. In ordering left face, Boris had pointed them in the wrong direction. Well, I'll fix that. Right face. No, about face. No, left. And while Boris tried frantically to correct his mistake, Colonel Bogus was examining General Broadbeam's examination papers. But the only thing you could possibly be is... Yes? A general... You're released, sir. And the general dashed out of the guardhouse in time to save our heroes. In no time at all, the disguised Boris found himself in the pokey. I told you not to go on giving orders, darling. I only got one more to give, Natasha. What's that? Shut up your mouth! And in just a few minutes more, General Broadbeam had the whole upsidasium vault surrounded by a company of soldiers. We'll try to sneak up on him from inside, General. Right, Rocky. Now hear this, Mr. Big. You can't possibly get away. Come out with your hands up. Now that I am so close to success, never. Unfortunately, Rocky chose that moment to enter the vault. But before he knew what was happening, had been seized, bound, and gagged by Mr. Big. Now we shall see who has the upper hand. And grabbing a huge ingot of the precious obsidasium, the arch criminal started out of the vault. No, I got you. Oof. <laughs> Stand back, stand back, Mr. Moose, if you don't want your little friend to be hurt. You wouldn't dare. Would he, Rock? <laughs> Ooh. And as Bullwinkle stood by helplessly, Mr. Big stepped boldly out of the building. Here he comes, men. Ready, aim. Hold it, General. That's my buddy he's got with him. You mean Rocky is a hostage? He's a squirrel, and don't you forget it. I guess we're helpless. Sure enough, Mr. Big, with Rocky as his prisoner, marched unscathed to the front gate of Fort Knickknack and stepped through to freedom with the upsidasium still in his grasp. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean this story ends with the bad guys winning? Looks like it, Mr. Moose. Well, that does it. I'll never watch TV again. But just then, a remarkable thing happened. I thought so. What do you mean, remarkable? Everything is exactly the same as it was. I... Oh, 
Oh, what is it? Sure enough, the fabulous anti-gravity metal was up to its old tricks and was lifting Mr. Big higher and higher under the air. Let go! Let go, you fool! Never! But that's a one-way trip, your own fella. Let loose of that stuff. We'll catch you. Never! Never! It's mine, do you hear? Mine! 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 And the greedy thief, unwilling to part with his ill-gotten gains, kept rising higher and higher under the air until he disappeared from view and was never seen again. Rocky was safe and the villains foiled. Yay! Well, our story did have a happy ending after all. But boy, it was close. And now here's a final word from our hero himself who says... <laughs> Translation, be with us next time for the further adventures of Rocky... The Flying Squirrel!